We're live. Atten? Here. Yeah. Order? Here. Press? Present. Steinbring? Here. Turner? Here. Welsh? Here. Motion to excuse Deacon and decap it? Second. Well, I need a first. So moved. Thank you. Second. Uh, Atten? Yes. Howarder? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? Yes. Welsh? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome to the August 9th, 2022 council meeting. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is the minute, or the next thing is minutes from the appointment. I'm, I'm going to appoint. No. Okay. Sorry. The appointment of Janet as clerk pro tem. We need a motion and second. So moved. Second. Sorry. Um, that would be Atten. Yes. Order. Yes. Press. Yes. Steinbrink. Yes. Turner. Yes. Welsh. Yes. Next is minutes from the council meeting of July 12, 2022. I have a comment. Top page four. Um, under the safety committee comments, there's a, a uh, I don't know if that's needs to be maybe a separate paragraph around the where it starts middle of the paragraph at the top of page four, which says the American security alarm monitoring program is a grandfathered program. As it goes from talking about the uh, safety cameras to the alarm system. To make, and I, don't, and I make another paragraph here. Yes. Saying. Okay. Anything, anything else? Uh, page three, paragraph three. Um, the response rate um, for individuals was 30%. I think that ought to be in there somewhere. It's not. And the margin of error. I have to say that again because I'm not that fast. I'm sorry? I have to say that again. I couldn't hear you. The response rate in terms of the proportion of people who responded to the uh, questionnaire was 30%. And that should be in there somewhere. It's what? 30%. Um, was that said in the meeting? It's on all the papers. It was, it was said in the meeting. Of course it was. Okay. Um, what, what, what's the count? So I'm sorry. Postcards were mailed to 969 addresses and 418 respondent or household respondent. Yeah, the, the, the individual response rate needs to be in there as well, which is 30%. So you're talking about uh, I, individual? The, the proportion of adults in the village who responded to the questionnaire was 30%. That's what needs to be said. And the margin of error, um, according to the consultant, was 4.7%, plus or minus, not 3%. Sandra said 3% in the meeting. The, the consultant said it at a different time. Well, I think we should put in there what's correct. But we have to put what was said at well, the meeting. Well, can you put parenthetically maybe this was a mistake? I don't Why think not? we can, Todd. Hmm. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, Janet. Atten? Yes. Howarder? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? Yes. Welch? Yes. Next on the agenda is pay ordinance 1264 for $497,896.44. Move to approve. Second. Did Chip, did you second that? I did, yes, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Patton? Yes. All order? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? Yes. Welsh? Yes. Okay, we're going to. Skip financial statement. Our treasurer is coming, but he can't get here till about six o'clock. So we'll move to mayor's report. Got a variety of things to read since the last meeting. Uh, this is from um, Mayor Schneider. We, we appreciate Gates Mills providing police officers for our safety town program last week. Officer Newsom and Officer Sachetta 
were assets to our program. They helped teach safety lessons to our participants. We appreciate the continued support of Gates Mills in our program and look forward to next year. Uh, that is from Betsy. She was the coordinator at um, Gilmore. I guess I should get these this way. Uh, oh, this is from the uh, Penders. Karen, several days ago, Kathy was heading west on Old Mill Road, and as she approached the S-curve, realized Emily McCartley had fallen and was near the edge of the eastbound lane. Oh, wow. She immediately had the police called, and in spite of this harrowing experience, somehow further serious tragedy was avoid avoided. The purpose of this letter is to complement the professional response <clears throat> of officers Mitchell Cole and Anthony Rowe tunnel to the specific circumstances at the scene and their sensitive follow-up thereafter. How fortunate we are to have Chief Greg Minicello leading the competent men and women of our police department. Kathy and I express our gratitude to you and the council. All the best, Jim and Kathy Pender. And uh, Mayor Dave, or this is to the Mayor Dave at Service Department, Gene and St. Christopher staff. Last night, we concluded our inaugural production of You Can't Take It With You as part of our Play in the Park series. Not knowing just how many people would attend, I would say that we had a rousing success. We had about 60 to 70 people attend from the village, guests of the cast, and other people who heard or read about the production. We even avoided all the rain in the area. We didn't even get wet. Thank you, to, thank you all for your help and support. Uh, Mayor, this big thank you to you and from the players and your support of the community theater. We are willing to take a chance in a new, and you're willing to take a chance in a new event in our community. Dave, you and our staff are the best in the city around. You're helping work with, in working with St. Christopher's and securing the tent and all the setup uh, shows how much we all love our village. Thank you all. This could not have been done without all the help. Uh, please give our special thanks to Trevor John from the play from the players. Jean, also to you. Thanks for getting the word out to the community and their <clears throat> uh, to support our production. Please send a follow up message to the village of how the whole event went. And please do not forget Mike and Tom at the community house. They're always there to help the players. Looking forward to working to the next event. Dale Fant, Gates Mills Players. Uh, also on August 28th from two to four, we're going to have Rock Around the Clock, which is a dedication of our new clock, which I hope you've noticed that was uh, the money for that was donated by all the village organizations. And there'll be uh, a dedication, a few speeches, dancing, ice cream and cake from two to four on the 28th. And also school is starting the week of the 21st through the 25th. Uh, private and public schools. So please watch around that uh, for buses and kids in <laughs> unusual places. And that's all I've got. Clerk's report. Do you have anything for Beth? No. no. Uh, next, we'll move to Gates Mills Land Conservancy presentation. Rob Galloway, welcome. Mayor, speak to the microphone. Yes. Great. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having me. I don't think I'll be too long. Um, I'm going to cover six topics to bring you up to speed on current conservancy efforts, finance, membership, technology, engagement, locking and tackling, and directors. Starting with finance, our current assets are $826,000. We have one liability, which is a mortgage loan payable to the estate of Jane Clark. That's currently at the amount of $282,000. We pay quarterly interest and principal on that. And as far as our receipts this year, we received, uh, it was unexpected, an estate bequest one of very few we've ever received, $20,000 from the estate of Ann Dickinson. We don't really have any connection with her. We didn't know it was coming. 
But of course, we're grateful and we thanked the estate. We also received one levy check, which just came in recently, $62,000. So the village should have had about the same amount coming its direction. And the other uh, receipts comprise our membership dues, $20,200. We have operating expenses, which are things like um, insurance, accounting, uh, payroll, office supplies, and things like that. To date, our, our operating expenses are 15400 which is right on budget. We usually run a $30,000 budget. We've made no land acquisitions, spent no money on land type transactions this year. I wanna talk then about membership. This is a great story. Um, in dollars, I just mentioned $20,200 by the end of July. Compared to last year, through the entire year, we had $23,000. So we're almost where we were last year for the entire year today, you know, going into August. And we'll have one more membership solicitation letter in September. So fingers crossed, we probably won't double that, but we usually we usually attract about $25,000 in membership a year, but that's over a whole year. So we're looking good there. How, how many How many individuals is that? Or just getting to it, Chip. Oh, okay. in, the, in, in, in terms of the number of members, uh, that's another good story. Last year, we had 104 members, which was actually a disappointing year. Um, Last year was a difficult year for lots of reasons that all of us probably understand and can remember. But this year, we're at 98, only partway through the year. So 98 today compared to 104 last year for the whole year. So again, we're hopeful. Uh, we're going to make some extra initiatives this year to reach out uh, again to those who haven't yet joined. Um, by personal meetings, handwritten notes, phone calls, and things like that. Rob, what would it have been its best year as far as yeah, the good question. number of members? Yeah, Michael, um, my memory on that is we were, our kind of high watermark was about 200 members. That goes back eight or 10 years. And we've had a steady decline. It's been frustrating, uh, but it's it, it's been the way of, our group, it's been the way of other, a lot of the other groups in the village too. But, um, you know, we're, we're, we've set out to reverse that. And I, I think we're going to make good progress this year. So that's a good question. And then on membership, uh, one of the questions in the questionnaire was how many David, are... one of the questions in the questionnaire was how many of you are currently a member of the Land Conservancy? And the number of people who said yes is double the number Rob just mentioned. So <laughs> we've got we've got some interlopers. But but on the other hand, anybody who pays tax in this town, uh, in a sense, is a member. Um, so I think there's a lot of confusion about what membership actually means, whether it's by family, whether it's by individual. If I pay my taxes, am I a member? A little clarity around that would help, I think. I could give you a little now, and I can give you more if you want it later. But um, uh, we count members by the check that comes in the mail. So if it comes from the Atten household, it might be that David's a member, it might be that Sharon's a member. Whoever wrote us the wow. check, that's the member, that's gotcha. one member. Uh, so it's not by household. And uh, membership is not just by virtue of being a resident in the village and paying taxes. No. Uh, we are a separate 501c3 organization, freestanding, mm -hmm. and we have directors and we have members like directors and shareholders, like shareholders of BP. So if you're a shareholder of BP, you paid for your shares. If you're a member of Gates Mills Land Conservancy, you made a contract, you, you paid your membership dues. Yeah. And That's fine. if you're a village resident, you're not a member of the, the Land Conservancy. That's interesting. I hadn't noted what you, what you said though, about the respondents to the questionnaire. So Yes, there's confusion somewhere. If you extrapolate the number David gave you to the number of people in the village, and you assume we have a representative sample, it would be more like six or 700 members you have. 
I don't know if that's based on a 30% response rate. I, I didn't do the math on that, sorry, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Well, that would be nice. That would be three times our record. So that would be good. And it's our goal. Rob, just a comment too. You can, I don't know if there are, but you don't have to be a resident of the village to be a member e either. So do you? You do not, you do not, Sandra, but yeah. to be a voting member, you do need to be a resident of the right. village. Yeah. Technology, we're coming into the proper century here. Um, with the addition of Jamie Carricker to our board, he's a technology and website guru. He's redone our website. He's made it more interactive uh, and updated things that are behind the scenes on that website to make it more robust. There's more work to do, but having a person on the board that knows how to do that is tremendous. And we did we have not ever had that on, on the board. Um, the other item, which is really the star of the show, is our new digital newsletter. And the star of the star of the show is Celeste McClung, who has taken the lead and almost single-handedly, yes, I don't know who that was. <laughs> This is a tremendous and major initiative. Um, we saw this morning at our board meeting, the next issue, which will be our second issue. Uh, we plan to do three per year. Um, this is a way to connect with people, to get our story out, to get the stories of the village and the history of the village out to people like it's never happened before. So I think you'll be excited when you get the next newsletter is chock full of history, conservation, um, and should, other engagement. Should I put how people get that? They get that by their email. Thank you for asking. We have, I believe, around 700 email addresses of people who live, of, of village residents. So this is a penetration that we've never, ever had clo close to. For the land conservancy and it may be for any any of the probably for any of the village organizations don't have that kind of uh you know connectivity so that's huge for us we think it will drive membership we, we think it'll drive uh motivation and uh ultimately donations lastly on technology uh we're thinking about and we're probably going to undertake a GIS mapping uh, mechanism where we can take the, what now is a static map of the village that has the Conservancy's properties identified. And we can turn that into a dynamic map so that not only can we make it available to whoever we wanna make it available to over the web, but there will be information that there's no way we could put the level of detail in a written document and it can be continually updated. So as we purchase new properties or get new easements, we'll have a, a rolling and ongoing updated map. This has been a bit of a challenge for us in the past several years, just keeping our paper map updated because it needs printing and it needs somebody to like do it. But here uh, we're gonna move into to the current century and beyond uh, with GIS uh, capabilities. I'm told that if we're out doing our inspections of the properties, we can and, and will have downloaded the mapping uh, function onto our, our cell phones. And as we walk, we can tell and watch where we are on our property vis-a-vis -vis its boundaries, the topography, the canopies, the soil types, the watershed, the, you know, the wetlands. So it's it's taking all the data that already exists in the world and making it useful for our organization. Great. Engagement, um, we have to shout out Sandra for her school collaborative efforts. This is um, a new effort. Actually, six or eight years ago, there was some of this done by Tom Lederbach with the schools. This involves Mayfield School, Westlake, Hawken, and US and their science programs to get the teachers and the students on our property. We, um, in April, we had 14 students and an advisor doing basically research and invasive species removal. 
up on Sherman Road. We have another similar program like that planned at the end of September. Uh, this That will be 20 Hawkins students and, and a science teacher. We've had um, two property tours in addition. One of the Clark property it was, it was widely publicized, but we didn't plan it well enough in advance to leave quite enough time to generate a big response. But those who did come enjoyed it. I led that tour on the Clark property. And then uh, recently we had a tour of folks out at the Sherman Road Preserve again. This was focused on wildflowers and we had a, um, a naturalist out there uh, giving, giving basically a lecture and the people loved it. Uh, at the band concert, some of you might have bumped into Jay Haddam, who's the beekeeper up at the Sherman Road property. He was giving a presentation on beekeeping at Sherman Road on the Conservancy land at the band concert. So again, trying to find ways to connect what we do with events and people you know, in town. Um, we are thinking about putting a driveway parking, like not parking, but some, some hard, harder surface up on Sher Sherman Road, because if we were to get more vehicles in there, uh, the ground is mushy. So we're exploring a little bit of infrastructure up there and we'll be mowing a path, a walking path uh, on Sherman Road Preserve in the, in the next couple of weeks to allow for more ability to get into the meadows and see really what's out there. Blocking and tackling consists of annual inspections. That takes a lot of effort. Um, monitoring trees and fences, trees fall, fences break. And also a lot of times our neighbors will inform us that they're afraid of a tree that's on conservancy property may be endangering or, or leaning over or potential for causing damage on their property. So that's a constant communication and upkeep process. We've had some transition there uh, about who's overseeing that, but I think we're on top of that at this point. And we have upcoming our uh, five-year reaccreditation by the Land Trust Alliance. That's a big deal. It's big for reputation and credibility, but it's also a big effort. So I think that's coming up at the end of next year, but we're planning a year ahead because it takes so much effort. Um, lastly, on board governance, uh, we have four directors whose terms are coming up in the fall, three of whom are elected and one of whom is appointed by the mayor. The three who are, who are up for, whose terms are ending that would be elected are Cindy Zins, Leah Whitten, and Nancy McGinnis. I believe they all will want to continue. I hope they will because they're doing great work for us. Um, we do have one open slot, which was uh, because of a resignation of Cindy Altus early on in the year. We have somebody identified to fill that spot. We haven't voted on it yet as a board. That would happen at the annual meeting in September. And lastly, uh, Mayor, I think that Sandra actually, Sandra's term is up to be decided by you as to whether you wanna continue Sandra, to appoint Sandra to the board. So that's it. Those are my items. Rob, um, your, your term is coming to an end too, is it not? Correct. Can you tell us anything about the succession plan for the leadership, for your job? Well, um, I have it figured out, Michael, but it isn't public yet, but you'll be happy with it. It's not me. <laughs> I didn't mean that in any way that you wouldn't be happy with it. Sure you didn't. <laughs> no, I did not, David. It was a statement. I have, uh, this is a question that potentially is one for the Land Conservancy as well as you know, council and the village, which is tree canopy, trends in tree canopy. You read statistics that in Northeast Ohio, it's declining. You hear, I've heard that in our village, the trees, we looked at a picture from the late 1800s, early 1900s. There weren't many trees here, apparently. 
I don't know if that's true, but I think that's what I've seen in some pictures. And that therefore the trees that have been planted are approaching 100 plus years old and a lot of trees that's that's near the end of their life. Um, we obviously have some diseases going on. I hear that there's lots of effort underway to breed or to whatever uh, trees that are disease resistant of various types. I think I've heard that Holden might be active in parts of that. I don't know. I think you're still on the Holden board. I am. Um, and I'm just wondering if what would it entail, you know, if, if the village said or land conservancy said, yeah, you're right. So we're going to go plant one tree. Whoop de do. You know, it'd be nice. Nobody's going to say bad to that. But do we need to be thinking about some sort of a reforestation program? What would one, what would a meaningful one actually look like? I don't know if that's something that land conservancy could do a little homework and say, you know, it would take a thousand trees or a million trees or how you go about it. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure there's some community in the country that is more, more working more on a reforestation plan. And I'm not saying this is something we would want to do next month, but I think it's something we may want to, you know, we're working on a longer range plan for the village. Um, it's possible if and when uh, traffic cameras come in that we might actually get some, some money from that. And one thing to do with that would be to maybe reinvest in, I mean, it's just one of many ideas. If we did get some extra money, uh, look at a reforestation, but I have no idea what that, how you'd even start. And I, I don't know if that rings with you. I was thinking of you in your role, both with Holden and with the Land Conservancy. So just park the thought, but if it's something that um, just seems to me it would be in concert with Land Conservancy and whatever that would entail. Um, I caught you on the fly. I think you were having dinner at Sandra at uh, Sarah's, and I um, and I asked about getting on, you know, the public getting on land conservancy property, and you said they really can't because of liability and liability concern, I guess. Um, and I guess I'm still struggling with that. We have a lot of village property that's public land, and I don't know how that handles. I don't know you're a not for profit. I'm just wondering if if that's something that should be at least talked about. I have no idea what it would entail, but there's a certain, we get the feedback that, you know, there's all this land conservancy, but we're not allowed to do anything about it. We just look at it as we drive by. But on the other hand, I'm not sure that, you know. I, I have to say, I, I agree with Councilman Auerder on both points. On the tree can, canopy point, when CT consultants gave their initial presentation, I think you might even have been there. Uh, one thing I noticed was, we lost about twice as much tree canopy as did our neighbors in Hunting Valley, which suggests to me it's not just about tree diseases. There's something more to it than that. And secondly, yeah, if we're going to conserve more land uh, or, or even the inventory we've got now, it should be nice if people could use it within reason. Uh, well, I can try to respond to both of those points. On the first, um, I think that there, that our our group would not have nearly the professional scientific competence to to actually be giving advice on tree canopy or, or reforestation. Uh, that's a huge question that, that takes input from multiple you know multiple directions. It's really a science. It's really it's really a science question. But um, just like the community. Um, strategic plan, which is a collaborative plan, I would think that the conservancy would be all in on being a collaborator with that. And <clears throat> to, the, to the degree our properties are affected, we wanna be a part of that, right? So I don't think probably you could look to us to lead that charge, but we would wanna be at the table trying to be helpful with that. On the second point, <clears throat> I think more specifically, Chip, my answer to you was that the two concerns we have about having free access to our properties are liability and also that um, a lot of our properties are small. And so there are neighbors nearby and neighbors don't want to have the public coming along to the property next door sort of willy nilly. And so there's a balance there. 
And the way I think we've struck that balance is that we've we've had access, which has been planned, um, and it's been focused on our larger properties. So we're not running 14 people through, you know, your net right next door to you know your house. That, that's that's not really that's not a good long term plan. It doesn't really benefit anyone. Um, we've We've struggled a little bit with where to strike that balance, but when you look at the number of properties we have and their individual characteristics, many of them actually are wetlands, ravines, slopes, or they're small, or they're right in amongst other houses. So I give you my own view, those you have to take off the table because you can't have people walking along in there unless maybe it's part of a guided supervised tour. Other properties like the Sherman Road Preserve, which we've really only owned and had access to for four or five years. And you can hear from my presentation, we're using that more actively than we ever were. But that's a great example of, yes, that's made for having educational opportunities. Likewise, um, what we call Woodstock Woods, which is 10 acres on Woodstock Road. Um, we have not had people on that property for a few years. But that was a location that Tom Lederbach would very frequently take school groups with like a nature nature advisor. Uh, and that's another great property for what we were just talking about. The third is a property on Riverview Road right along the river. And it's it's somewhat close to its neighbors, but there's enough space that you're not encroaching. If you brought people in, you wouldn't be encroaching on left and the right, but it's great river access. So it's great access for the education about the river. And we used to do more of that. We need, we need to get back to that. In fact, it's a live topic amongst our board as to how do we locate more places like that and get more people out there. But ultimately where we are at the moment is those events will be supervised or guided in some way, um, maybe, Maybe up at Sherman Road, we could think of a way if we get that path mode and we get comfortable with its sighting and we get a little turnaround in there so people don't go in there and get stuck in their cars. Uh, maybe we would think about having that be sort of open without supervision. But you have to take it property by property, really. Okay. It's the best you know, Rob, it, it has come up along uh, over the years many times questioning being allowed on the property or not. So maybe a, that would be an article for the newsletter. Just how like, you explained it now with pictures and what that some are smaller and you don't want to intrude on the neighbors that are close by, but yet some are bigger and have planned events. I think that could go a long way to understand why uh some places you can go on the property and and most you can't or something that could be very helpful well i wouldn't want that to be considered an, an open invitation no that's, no but an explanation about it i i don't think anybody has ever gone into detail and explained it like you have and Maybe so not. there is right. thought behind it it's good makes sense one other thing you said no land acquisitions to date and i know you don't want to comment if there's possibility but do you see that possibility the balance of this year's or anything that's looking for a uh, phone or? call came in a few days ago but i i haven't got my finger on that yet about potentially a conservation easement and i don't know whether that would be just accepting an easement as a gift or whether it would be some kind of trade where we'd be asked to you know write a check in exchange for an easement i just don't know and that's that's the only thing active potentially yeah. active on the list okay yeah. Maybe, I mean, Sandra, can you, or Celeste, can you th think of anything else? No. no, it's been quiet on that front, actually. Okay. Can I make one comment? There is federal money available. We got a grant. Uh, you have 10 acres. We got a federal grant for an arborist to come in from out of state, actually, and develop a plan for our property of street content. And uh, I, it would certainly be available. If it was available to us, it's got to be available to the village. 
So you might want to check into it. Interesting. Thank you, Charlie. I like that. It's a good comment. Um, the only other thing I'd add is to Chip's point, if this is a village wide concern, we got to be thinking in terms of a broader scope than just a particular property. But ultimately, it does come down to each parcel because, as we know, each one is has its own characteristics. But thank you for that. Any other questions for Rob? Might be your last time. <laughs> you didn't say that with enough, enough uh, sadness. I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Rob. Very nice. My great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next one is committee reports. Okay. Um, two committee reports. Uh, one, the uh, South Tower Committee um, might be taking a hiatus. Um, there's uh, some progress with Verizon and the Gilmore site. Um, that sounds encouraging, and it could be in the sense that at least one aspect of Verizon moving forward is underway, but that doesn't mean that the next hurdles would be cleared or not. <coughs> um, if that were to progress, um, you may recall that there was a possibility that as Gilmore was putting up uh, lights for their sporting, for their field, um, they were going to hope to be able to put some cell tower communicators on top of those tower, of those light towers, light poles. Um, the, the lack of, of response from any of the cell carriers uh, Gilmore made the decision that they didn't want to wait. They really want the, the lights up by their first game, which I think is in a couple of weeks. So they've gone ahead and the poles that are going up don't have the structure underneath to support them putting uh, cell tower uh, equipment on top of those poles. So if, um, if they were to proceed and get a, a cell tower on the Gilmore property, it would be a standalone tower, which is a little bit of deja vu. That's where everybody was two and a half years ago before, uh, before Gilmore changed his mind. So, um, so at this point, we're as a village, or at least from my vantage point, and I've talked to the mayor, we're so anxious to get cell coverage that if that's what Verizon wants to do. The uh, we've always understood that once you get one carrier and a tower underway, that uh, build it and they will come and other carriers will join. So, <clears throat> so. We are fully supportive if that's the direction to get a tower on Gilmore's property and uh, um, and we'll keep you posted, monitor that, and hopefully we'll hear more in future meetings. Um, so that's the cell tower communication from the cell tower committee of one. Um, now I'll turn to the comprehensive plan, just a brief update. We had the advisory, second advisory committee meeting after our last council meeting. Um, the survey results were presented or the highlights of the survey result were presented was the primary, the first half, so to speak, of the meeting. And then the, um, and by the way, the complete results of the survey are online. And I believe all of the comments, I know that the consultant's working on uh, getting all of the comments listed, and I don't know if they're all up there yet, or yeah, there there's a lot of stuff on the website, so I didn't check for that. But if they're not, I know she's working on getting those up. Um, then uh, the latter part of the meeting then was the consultant uh, putting up an initial uh, cut of what she viewed as the goals and issues for the uh, advisory committee to begin to mull over and decide what they really wanna focus on for the balance of their efforts. Um, and then obviously would be working on those and coming up with recommendations. So I know that there, um, she's been getting feedback from that initial cut over the last couple of weeks. Um, I believe she's going to be posting um, the, the you know the feed with the feedback, what would be called the initial cut of the uh, of the goals and issues, um, and then that'll obviously get refined, and then the advisory committee will continue to be working on that. 
there will be uh, going forward five more advisory committee meetings. Um, I don't yet know the what she thinks the timing will be at this point. I believe that the next advisory committee meeting will be sometime in September, and I'll get to the events between now and then in just a second. And I don't know the timing of the, what would then be the remaining four uh, meetings and when she thinks uh, she would the consultant would be publishing a final report, but we'll certainly try to have that by the next council meeting. So the next big step in the uh, advisory, I mean, in the uh, comprehensive plan process is really uh, public, further public feedback. Um, so this next Monday night, there's a, uh, a town hall workshop here um, at the community house from six to eight. Um, there's a lot of communication that's going out as we speak. Um, you'll be getting, if you didn't get it today, you'll be getting what looks like a pink sheet that, uh, that, that alerts you to attend the town hall workshop. Um, now that's going to be sort of a one-on-one. -on -one. Each uh, resident that comes in will look at uh, posters of some of the findings so far and some of the issues, and they'll be making notes and comments with uh, little stick em notes, and I guess there'll be some sort of, uh, you put dots on various things. I, I, I don't know. It's what the consultant's typically done. So she's got that set up, and that'll be Monday night. And then we've been working very hard to uh, get established. Uh, we're going to have six neighborhood meetings um, starting a week from tomorrow will be the first one. Uh, happens to be at the Fidelis house on uh, Village Trail, and that's at, I believe, uh, that one's at six o'clock uh, from six to eight. I'll talk about what the where the neighborhood meetings are, and then I'll talk about how those are going to take place. Um, the next meeting will be the next night for uh, a couple of the other neighborhoods on the uh, 18th here at the community house from six to eight. The Third neighborhood meeting will be that Saturday, a week from this next Saturday, August 20th, from 10 a.m. to 12 noon here at the community house. The fourth neighborhood meeting will be Monday the 22nd, so two weeks from yesterday, uh, from 7 to 9 at the community house. And then the fifth meeting will be uh, Tuesday the 23rd, uh, from 6 to 8 at the lower campus of Gilmore. That uh, is a particularly large neighborhood. Just to remind you, the consultant divided the village up into 10 neighborhoods. Turns out there's a wide diversity or wide disparity in number of residences per neighborhood. So that's why we combined some neighborhoods. In the case of neighborhood seven, I think it's 180 residences. Um, so we're just limiting that to that one neighborhood. And then uh, the final um, meeting will be Thursday, August 25th at the community house. Now, uh, the question of course is, how does somebody know what their neighborhood is? So we have been working very hard um, to figure out how to get the word out. Um, so we're doing three things. Every mailbox is getting this today or tomorrow. Um, that both announces the town hall and the neighborhood meetings. The logistics are such that it would have been nice to have gotten it out a little sooner, but the printer got delayed and the post office is taking their time. But, um, but at any rate, it will get out. The question then becomes, how does a neighbor know what neighborhood they're in? And they will be able to go to the website as one option and look up their street address and it'll tell them their neighborhood number. The uh, second question, form of communication to the neighbors is to all the residents is a um, a door hanger, a doorknob hanger uh, that's been printed up. And we enlisted, we have 100 volunteers, it is literally 100 on our list, broken down by each of the neighborhoods that are going around right now to every house and putting on their doorknob, at, at a minimum, putting on their doorknob a hanger that alerts them to their neighborhood meeting. Uh, their particular meeting date has been circled on that because we couldn't print out uh, 10 different door hang types of door hangers. Um, we're encouraging everybody that if they can't meet, they can't make the particular night of their neighborhood 
that they're welcome to come any of the other nights. The third form of communication is a postcard that's coming out any day now that will be specifically addressed to each neighborhood that will alert them as to their specific night of when their neighborhood is meeting. And again, encourage them if that doesn't work for them that they're welcome to come to any of the other nights. And we're gonna be sending out a Gates Mills Connect, I think in the next day or two for the town hall meeting, town hall workshop. And then following Monday, we'll send one out to remind everybody of the neighborhood meetings. So the word will be out and hopefully we'll get a fair amount of response to the neighborhood meetings. Now, you might ask, how is the neighborhood meeting going to take place? Um, we have uh, a committee, I guess I'd say, of about 10 or 15 facilitators just to uh, get the, move, the meetings moving along. Um, the same posters that'll be at the town hall workshop will be uh, displayed here. If you think of the community house, that that's where one of the meetings is. Um, we'll have about a 20 minute or so introduction. Um, the residents in attendance will be able to come up and look at the posters, understand them in a little more detail. And then after the first 30 minutes of the, of the session, we'll then uh, we'll have round tables of 10 seats uh, per table and uh, people will be sitting at those tables and um, every table will take on issue number one, whatever that might be. It might be um, uh, community involvement because underlying all of the feedback is a desire from residents to to be more involved in the community. So what might that mean? We're working with the consultant to come up with questions, um, two or three questions. So each table will have 15 minutes to, to you know, at that table to talk about thoughts and what they would say. And then there'll be a, a scribe from that table. And then at the end of the 15 or so minutes, uh, table one will stand up and say, okay, here's one or two things that that we think uh, the advisory committee ought to be aware of as far as community involvement. There's ideas or, or concerns or, or whatever. Table two will stand up and add to that list and somebody will be summarizing all this on an easel on the, up in the front. Um, after going through all of the tables, then we'll go back and say, okay, so table one, was there anything more that you wanted to add that from your table's conversation? and keep going around until we've gotten all the feedback, but hopefully uh, roughly over 30 minutes. Then we'll shift, hand out another sheet for issue number two. Um, and we're waiting for the consultant to give us a sense of what she thinks the three issues, uh, topics of discussion ought to be. Um, and so we'll do the same drill on that next uh, discussion topic. And then we'll do the same for a third topic. So that's 30 minutes each. So the first 30 minutes, uh, a background, some findings, get familiar with things, then three issues, and that's the two hours. So uh, same content, same process for each of the six neighborhood meetings. So we're hoping from all this, and we're having a few members of the advisory committee help to facilitate. The facilitators aren't, aren't driving anything. They're just trying to explain the process. And then it's up to the tables and the residents to uh, to provide some feedback. So we're hoping from all this that we get a reasonable array of feedback that we can summarize it and feed it back to the advisory committee. And that'll be one of the parts of input for the September meeting. So quite a process. I can't tell you how many man hours Sandra and I, um, Larry Frankel and uh, Russ Berzon have been helping to get all of this organized and coordinated. I think one of you asked who are the volunteers and our hesitancy is we don't yet know people indicated they'd be willing, but we don't know if when they actually get called upon, um, we've broken it up into the neighborhoods with team leaders for each neighborhood. And so they might call an individual and they say, gee, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't really mean to, to commit myself. So we don't want to, we will finalize the list and hand it out at the next meeting. But as I said, it, 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 it's, I mean, I called a huge number, Sandra called a huge number. Um, so I think we have, you know, roughly 100 volunteers involved in getting the word out. So so that's the status of the advisory committee. Sandra, anything that jumped out that? Chip, one, one question of clarification. At the town hall, the one that's next Monday night, 
Will there be a presentation of some kind? Yes, for 30, 40, 45 minutes, I think, is a presentation. Okay, yes. and then there'll be a chance for the audience to ask any questions they might have. No, it'll be no. It's not a live forum. They'll be going around and giving their individual feedback, but it will not be a live forum. That's going to be the, the neighborhood meetings. That's where we get the, the feedback from the individuals. I think that distinction is an important one because I'm sorry. I think that distinction is an important one because I've been asked, shall I go to the community meeting or shall I go to my neighborhood meeting? Well, they serve slightly different purposes. So the answer really is, if you can, you should go to both. Yeah. I, That's an important distinction. Personally, David, truth be told, I, I can't totally explain. There's obviously overlap. So somebody that wants to get, get their feedback could certainly probably do it individually at the workshop or in a group discussion. So, and so I presume that there will be people that might want to go to both. So, yeah. Okay. My inclination would be to let them ask questions next Monday if they wish to. We've talked to the consultant about that and that just turns into a bitch session in her, in her uh, experience. So she's not, not looking for that. She's looking for the individual feedback, try to get a, a broad array because getting people just up and standing for two or three minutes to give their personal input is not the intent of the meeting. Yeah. And I think in, in general, it gives more people an opportunity to give, you know, to give feedback as opposed to a few people exactly. that yeah, have that's... a strong, you know, strong opinion. So like everybody will have a chance to comment on the, on the issues with a, with a dot system or, or post-it notes, et cetera, we'll get more feedback that way. Right. I don't want to be gloomy Gus, but um, 1300 people chose not to fill out the questionnaire, a questionnaire that we said would take 30 minutes. We're now saying, well, if you didn't do that, come to a meeting that would take two hours. If you come to two meetings, it'll take four hours. I, I just hope that people are going to say, yes, I'm going to do that. These are people, I'm, th I'm more concerned about the people who did not fill out the questionnaire than the ones who did. The ones who did will almost certainly show up for these meetings, I'm guessing. Um, well, I mean, you can't make a more of an effort. With, you know. No, you can't. I'm, I'm yeah. just saying it's a tough job. Yeah. But, uh, and I that was all the work. And that was why the neighbor, you know, the volunteers, the neighborhood outreach volunteers concept yep. came about because we all know if somebody calls you and says your neighbor yep. calls and says, you know, please come to this meeting with me, it's much yep. greater likelihood. But I, I agree with you, it's probably the people who have completed the survey who are most likely going to uh, attend. We'll see. Yeah. You know, one of the goals from the way back, even two and a half years ago when we were interviewing consultants was, and David, you were part of that process, how do we make sure that we've gotten as much engagement from the community as possible? And that was one of the things we used in evaluating which consultant to pick. And I'd say our goal is, and I'd say it a little bit facetiously, but if next year at this time, somebody comes up to me and says, what's this comprehensive plan? I didn't even know it was existing. I'd just have to say, what rock were you living under last year? Because in fact, the feedback I'm getting at the moment is people are getting sick of the communications. We're, we're hitting them from all sides all the time about it. So, um, so I'm not sure they're sick about it, but they're certainly getting the word. So I, I don't know what more to say. It's, uh, the consultant says that the response rate she's seen is higher than she typically sees in the community by a fair amount. So I think we're doing about as, I don't know, I'm sure we could be doing even better, but we're certainly trying. So thank you. One point of clarification. Uh, the, the initial results from the survey were, di were distributed on the internet with the answers, the verbal answers, the essay answers, as I call them, to four questions. There were nine other questions that invited uh, an essay answer. Are they going to be put on the website as well? Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's what uh, that's what he meant. Chris okay. working on. So the four are up there, but they're comp she's compiling the others because I guess it's just an enormous amount of it must be. comments. It must be. Yeah. And it, it's very important that we all read those comments. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't know. How oh, yeah. Write. In fact, in fact, you know, that she said when she when she reads all of them, you, you get you get a deeper sense of what the data might be really suggesting. But, you know, that's that's maybe just her interpretation. But but she says you get a lot of um, good, a lot more insight. That and if those answers could be up before Monday, that would be great. Yeah call tomorrow so we can okay. we can get an update Thank from her you. yep and again i applaud you too for all the work you're doing it's uh, extraordinary it's bigger than you thought it was right no oh. 
<laughs> you know, logistically, I, I, I have to say, I mean, I, I'll eat these words, but after we get these neighborhood meetings completed, then I'm hoping we can stand back and watch the proceeds of the advisory committee and wait for the report. I don't know. I'm yeah. sure they'll come up with something for Sandra and I to do. But uh. Yeah, you know, after all of his work and reaching out to all of these folks, I mean, it's really been a positive experience in the sense of, you know, I think we're, we've created commu community already just with, you know, this effort and getting more people involved sure. and um, uh, having them talk to their to their neighbors and uh, having folks step up to volunteer. So, I, and for me, there's been some success already just in having people meet their neighbors and oh, gosh, hear yes. about the issues. Yep. I think it's been a very involved, long process when it goes back to when we selected, which was when? <laughs> that was before COVID. Yeah. All together. Oh, yeah, that too. 19, so beginning 19. of 19, spring of 19. All good so far with it. Uh, next committee reports. Two, uh, two quick updates here on uh, safety and planning and zoning. On safety, uh, update on the speed cameras. October is still looking good for a, a go live date. There was actually a surveyor uh, in the village last week um, for the looking at. Um, locations for the installation of the cameras. Uh, the Lynnhurst court uh, has has come up with the, the advanced filing fee that they're going to charge for processing all the tickets. Um, and Todd is, is working uh, on finalizing some of the amendment language. We got a draft uh, early this morning from Gatso um, with containing the uh, about four sections of the master services agreement that have to be amended because of the Supreme Court ruling. Um, there's some language that, uh, that needs to be tightened up and we'll get that those marks back to Gatso. Uh, and my expectation is, is that council will have a, uh, the amendment as well as the revised ordinance um, well in advance of the September council meeting for review. Um, so that that's an update on the uh, the speed cameras. And I'll ask a question. There, sure. Please. Um, uh, I'm not sure this is a good question. Um, Mayfield Village, they're using a similar system, but their cameras are handheld and two hours in the evening, two hours in, in the morning. Um, by using that device and the GATSO technology, which they are using, I think, um, do they forego local government funding? Or uh, is that a way around avoiding? I, I believe the answer is yes. No, the answer is no, the answer is no, no because we're not automated. They, so, they, are, they are foregoing no, local no. government. So that means that we've got $60,000 that we could save, if you will, by doing handheld two hours a day. Uh, and I, I think that's something that's been considered, but I, you know, where Mayfield is doing this on 271, there's easy access to, to sit on the freeway, freeway and on the bridge uh, and on the bridge and do run radar. Uh, there's really no safe place for the officers to sit on 271 to, to run radar and do that. Um, so that's on cer Mayfield. certainly Mayfield. on Mayfield, on, on Mayfield. Yeah. Sorry. On Mayfield to, to do that. Well, when we think about $70,000, that could buy a couple of places where a police car could sit. Uh, yes, off and the, off the main drag. Todd can just thinking aloud. I'm, I'm not arguing. Yeah, no, and I'm just saying it's a difference. And, and our looking at probably in our indication is is that um, it's a matter of time before those handhelds are lumped in with the automated cameras. That seems to be okay. what what okay. the let's just uh, keep it in mind. Census okay. is, uh, and then there uh, there have been I guess a couple of questions regarding uh, alarm monitoring services, um, and, and I, I think the important thing to uh, to remember there is that, you know, I, I, the village is not in the monitoring business anymore for alarm systems. That's all being done through American Security or Gilmore or Seavers, whoever you you may have. And so if you're having issues with your uh, alarm system, that that's something that needs to be taken up with with the alarm company. I know uh, American Security, who does most of the monitoring for the village, had, I think, 80 or 100 residences um, where the communicator device was obsolete, need to be swapped out. And, you know, the last safety meeting, this is back in um, May, there's my understanding is that American security was in the process of contacting or had contacted all those homeowners that were impacted by that. I know we were one of them. Uh, we had our communicator swapped out and they you know, charged us $150 to, to do that. I've, I've had a call just today from a resident who had a similar problem that a couple of false alarms 
They called American security to say, it's a, it's a false alarm, don't worry. And they said, what? We didn't get any alarm on your system. Yeah, so they probably need to have American security come out and and check their, their system. And I've had the same situation and they're trying to tell me I need to spend a couple of thousand dollars for a new system. So I'm not very impressed, so. Uh, so that's safety. Uh, planning and zoning, uh, interesting meeting that unfortunately I was on vacation for last week, but I did have a chance to talk to some of the uh, commission members uh, last week regarding um, a uh, newer homeowner in the village requesting a use variance uh, for allowing alpaca um, in the village. And the way the zoning code is written today is if the zoning code does not specifically reference something, it is prohibited. So there is no uh, specific reference in the zoning code or ordinance for alpaca, so they are prohibited. Um, you know, I, I, I maybe take a little different uh, approach to this, and I look at some of the criteria from a use variance from a legal standpoint that um, the Board of Zoning Appeals would have to go through to approve something like this, and I really struggle with um, you know, some, some of the questions that are on here where the variance requested stems from a condition which is unique to the property at issue uh, and not ordinarily found in the same zone or uh, district. Um, the variance is consistent with the general spirit and intent of the zoning code. Um, there's no other economically viable use which is permitted in the zoning district. And so you read through these criteria and really none of them uh, would apply, which leaves, you know, planning and zoning with you know, in my opinion, having to take a little bit more of a proactive approach and say, if we have residents in the village that are looking to have alpaca, uh, we should probably look at exploring a potential ordinance uh, in planning and zoning that would then be brought to council for approval. And, and I guess, you know, from where I sit and my involvement in planning and zoning, I wanted to get uh, maybe some comments from council regarding um, having an ordinance to permit alpaca and Todd, maybe some of your comments on, is this a, a potentially a broader issue with, um, you know, I'll, I'll use the term domestic farm animals and can we only per permit alpaca or do we have to permit goat, sheep, pigs, and, and, you know, where's the, the village really um, fall down on this? I agree with you that council should be involved in some way. I know there's been discussion about roosters too in the past, uh, but well, we can't do just alpacas. We got to either dodge right. the issue or we got to do the broad. Yeah. yeah and, and part of this is, uh, you know, planning and zoning is a, effectively an a appointed body. Um, it's not an, an elected um, group of individuals. And so really uh, to create an ordinance uh, where one is prohibited, by the zoning ordinance, I, I struggle a little bit with and say, well, the, the proper place for this is the legislative process where it would go through planning and zoning, it would come to council, council would say yes or no, um, and would, then we have something on the books. And with respect to the chicken, the fowl, I know we are working on a, an ordinance for chicken. I think that will be at the next September planning and zoning meeting. I learned, so, I learned a long enough, time, if yeah. I may, I learned a long time ago that when you come up with a really difficult question in a, in a hierarchy, you delegate upwards. <laughs> Don't deal with it. Get the other guys involved because they're the ones you're working for. So I, I agree entirely with that for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> well, you know, any property owner really has the opportunity to apply for a variance. That doesn't mean it should be granted. Right. And this is a really difficult call. And planning and zoning faced that last week, knew that there weren't enough votes. We had some absences to approve it or disapprove it. And um, so there was discussion about should this be something that should go to council? And that's probably a wise idea, um, but just limiting it to alpacas, you might um, not uh, get a challenge to that ordinance down the road from someone who wants sheep, goats, or other types of animals or llamas, I suppose. Yep. There are differences between those animals from what we learned last week. Alpacas are pretty docile animals and not very intrusive, much less intrusive than horses that are permitted, by the way. So um, I think all of that probably needs to come to council at some point. Um, and um, you have to have a rational basis for any distinction that you're making. And sometimes it's hard to 
have a rational basis if a particular domestic animal is less intrusive than ones that you permit. And it will take some research as to which animals are less intrusive or more intrusive to make those distinctions if you're going to do that. From uh, as a member of planning and zoning, um, boy, I spent many hours on this topic last week. Um, first is just even the concept that if a use is currently prohibited because it's not in it's not in our code um, for planning and zoning to even embark on deciding whether they would allow a use while legally technically it's a variance um, to me that starts putting them in the shoes of deciding on behalf of the whole village so let's just play out for a minute that that planning and zoning and there was some sentiment among more than one that maybe we should really figure out how we could make this happen for this particular resident. And that was a very early, you know, a comment. So it doesn't mean it would, would proceed, but if it were to proceed, <clears throat> the use variance would define a lot of parameters. This is the size of, of lot. This is how setback, this is the amount of screenings. This is this, this is that. And when they're all done, in my opinion, they've ended up writing an ordinance. And I'm sitting here saying well, that, and, and then any other resident, I know that our law director might might say, no, every situation is unique, but it would certainly start to open the door that, gosh, my circumstances are awfully close, so I'd like alpacas. And suddenly we've had good people, the Planning and Zoning Commission is full of very good residents, but we've had non-elected residents coming up with implicitly an ordinance and allowing a use that's currently clearly prohibited. So to support your point, David, I think that's the kind of issue, and I hate to ever see planning and zoning give a use variance for something that's currently prohibited. I'm sorry, even if it's isolated to one person, it's you know it's one thing to say we have an ordinance and here's a variance to it, um, but to, to black versus white, prohibited is clear, use is clearly exactly the opposite of prohibited. So I don't see that really as a variance. I see it even if it's only pertinent to one resident. So. And I know I've learned that there's all kinds of, you know, it's special use and it's limited to the owner that's on it, et cetera. But I'm just not comfortable that that's a proper role for planning and zoning, not in concert with, with council. Um, now, I learned something else last week that uh, was words of caution, um, that if something's prohibited, it's prohibited. We don't have to debate, you know, it's sorry, but, but don't, you know, it's, it's prohibited. If you open the door and say, well, okay, it's gonna, we're gonna allow it, but here's the ordinance. Now you've opened yourself up to further interpretation. Uh, if you tried to make it alpacas, then you start to fight the, the llamas and the sheep and the goats and things like that. And so there's a certain sentiment to say, you know, you better just say, no, it's prohibited and thank you very much, but we don't allow it in our village. We heard very passionate speeches from two of our residents, one of whom is here tonight that said, you know, they didn't move into the village thinking that there would be farm animals next door, even if it's mild and, and unobtrusive like a like an alpaca, we just, that's not the ambiance of our village. And there's a lot of merit to that. And my guess is, this is my personal opinion, that's a lot of the sentiment of our residents. They didn't move here thinking that they want sheep and goats and people, you know, uh, uh, farm animals all around. So it's just a thought, but we need, so, yes, some guidance here yeah. of so Todd, yeah, Todd, given that planning and zoning has brought this to us now, what how do you recommend that we we proceed? Well, I don't think that planning and zoning has actually brought it to you. It's Chip that's bringing it to you and Craig, Craig. who was not there. But I think the planning and zoning should look at it, study it, and if they wish to recommend such an ordinance, then recommend an ordinance to council to review and work through and debate um, is probably the best way to do it unless council wants to jump in right now and ask for an alpaca ordinance or a domestic animal ordinance to put on first reading to start reviewing and debating which then will have to be referred to planning and zoning anyway under the charter <laughs> or a recommendation so that's the process okay all right good Thank you. Does that help, Craig? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think Todd's process sounds perfectly reasonable. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are newer to the village than I am, 
we used to have lions and tigers living in the village. <laughs> Harvey Layton had those, and that was extremely controversial. Now, now the there day. is an ordinance against wild, particularly with uh, people that had young children yeah, like you. <laughs> yeah, just as a point of reference, because some of the homework I did, there is a very clear definition to undomesticated animals versus domesticated, and there's 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 no debate on what's undomesticated and. I can assure you, lions and tigers are undomesticated. <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> and we have a very clear ordinance on that one. So, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Is that it? That, that's all. Yeah. Sandra? I have a quick, I just have a quick one. Positively Gates Mills. I hope you've all seen the little art house that's on the uh, on the path on the new walkway over by the post office. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Karen Galloway and to uh, Jim Stafford, whose idea that was. And uh, the, the intent of it is very similar to a little lending library, except in this case, it's uh, art, art that's done by villagers that you could either admire or borrow or take or replace with some artwork of, uh, of your own. So oh. stop by and, and take a look. It's, uh, it's very creative. We'll do an article about it in an upcoming uh, pink sheet. Thank you. Before we leave PNC behind entirely, I had a interchange with Dave the other day where I spotted a chain link fence when I was driving down Chagrin River Road. I thought they were illegal. And Dave came back and quite properly said, the ordinance reads they're illegal if they're in the front yard. In this particular case, there's a new chain link fence. It's right on the street, but it's not in the front yard. So Dave suggested we might want to consider broadening the ordinance to say visible from the road as opposed to front yard. That's a good idea because I've spent a lot of time pulling out chain link fence in the village. <laughs> it's a good idea. How does that process work and if we wanted to modify? Again, just ask me to draft something up and yep. uh, put it in front of council for first reading for your review debate. Does it go to PNZ first then? It it has to be referred by council to PNZ. I see. Um, under charter. That'd be a good idea. Are you going to? So I think you just got a request to do that, Todd. I'm not sure, but I think that is a formal request of council. No. Okay. Okay. I think that is a formal request of council. Yeah, I meant it to be okay. a formal request. Todd, can you please put that down about doing an ordinance about chain link fence anywhere? It, uh, excuse me, if that ordinance were passed, would the person who just put this fence up be forced to remove it? No. They would be grandfathered in some way. Correct. Uh, we're going to, uh, since Karen, that's... We got, the, we got one other set of committee reports. Okay. Okay. Uh, two, actually, both short. The Charter Committee and the Broadband Committee. On the Charter Committee, the only report is there is no report. We haven't done anything as yet. We got organized, what, two, three months ago, or two, three meetings ago. We're yet to really get our teeth into things. Uh, broadband, uh, we had a report in July. When Ann uh, uh, read her report to everyone, uh, the way we left it in July was, would uh, council and residents please submit questions? I don't think there've been a lot of questions to be honest, but we need to agree a way forward to deal with this issue. As we know, some of the options that have been put forth involve significant sums that might have to be invested on the part of the village, some don't, but uh, I think we need to set up some machinery that kind of keeps uh, the advantages and the knowledge that Ann and Larry have, but also gets some others involved as well because there's significant money involved. So I, I would suggest we broaden the committee or form a new committee or something along those lines. Uh, I know Ann contacted everybody, I'm sure on uh, council and whatnot for questions and answers, and she will be back. Uh, I believe it's at the end of this month and uh, Larry and her and, I know you're involved on it. I think we're going to get together and just get a focus going forward. Very well. I have a short one. Um, the school liaison committee, which is now called the Mayfield City Schools Liaison Committee, which has broadened its horizon somewhat, um, has invited uh, Superintendent uh, Dr. Barnes to come and speak to the council at the September 13th council meeting, uh, which is great. 
um, give us an update on what's going on and we can ask questions and so on. I think it's important that villagers and anybody, councilmen, anybody who have questions about the school system, particularly in light of the answers that we've got from the, uh, the questionnaire associated with the comprehensive plan, I think we can begin to focus in on some important questions that are important for the village going forward. And it would be good if he could address them uh, when he comes to talk to us in a month, a month's time. Um, the other piece of news is that the enrollment isn't complete yet, but GMES looks as if it's right today, has an enrollment of 93 students, 23 of whom live in the village. Um, so the numbers are down on what we were a year ago. Um, but as I've been told, and I know in schools, uh, enrollment continues until a, at least a week after school starts. <laughs> so we won't know the final numbers, but it's getting smaller and less relevant for the village in terms of education. So that was it for the uh, Mayfield City Schools Liaison Committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, at this point, I'm gonna move that we go, that council go into an executive session to discuss the disposition of village property by lease and to seek the advice of the village's legal counsel regarding same. We need a second. Second. Before, before we vote, could is this something we could handle in public or is there something particularly confidential? I, I always err on the side of transparency if we can. It, it's my understanding that this is a particular lease with particular tenants and it's an, an early stage where there's confidential information being provided back and forth. And so it will be made public I'm sure soon if this moves forward. Could I, could I make an observation about? Uh... I'd, like to, I'd like to respond to your comment. And that is that I certainly support transparency and always have on my term on council. Um, I, I appreciate the question, but I um, also just want to state that those of, uh, those of us who are asking for this um, are not doing it to violate transparency. It's really to protect the leasees and the lessor, the village in this case. Um, there was a council meeting recently where a lot of things were made public that um, should have been ha handled in a, in a closed session. So that's why we're doing this. I'm looking the other way down the telescope. I was um, very disappointed. It was my first executive session last, last council meeting, July 15th. And the motion, I believe, and I'm, Todd will correct me if I'm speaking out of turn, but the motion I believe represented maybe a third of the proceedings in the, in the meeting itself. Um, there were other aspects that were discussed um, that were nothing to do with the motion as I saw it. And I believe that both topics, those that were covered by the motion and those that weren't should really have been dealt with in public. And I don't understand why that wasn't the case. Had I known that going into the session, I would first of all vote against it, and if it did, if it had passed, I wouldn't have attended. Uh, I'm I'm with David on that. I mean, I looking back into July, I don't think we covered anything in that meeting that shouldn't that couldn't have been covered in the normal session, and it should have been covered in the normal session. And I'd like to understand before I vote whether whether I agree that it should be confidential or not. I don't know enough at this well, point. We certainly can to vote. Can't say in public what is confidential. So you'll well, have could to you describe it without <laughs> violating. I, I think she described it well as disposition of village property via lease and getting advice from your legal counsel with respect to that. But that will have to And that's exactly what right? happened last time. Now you may not agree with that, I but I was there and I believe that everything that was discussed related to legal advice from me with respect to village leases and the and the particular village lease that was was at issue. So. Uh, one last comment. If we are going to have executive sessions, I would prefer to do it before the regular meeting starts or after, because last time we drove the audience away and I don't blame them. I mean, they didn't know if we were going to be there for 10 minutes or 10 hours. Perhaps we could give them an idea of when we'll reconvene so they can make an informed decision of whether to stick around. I, my guess is this will be 10 or 15 minutes. 10, 10 minutes. 
And by the way, I strongly disagree with both of your comments. I think the executive session was totally appropriate and dealt with the subject of matter. And that is how those things should be handled. And I think you're both very wrong in your opinions of that meeting. You disagree with us, that's fine. Okay. okay. I moved. Second. Second. Atten? Yes. Alwarder? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? Yes. Welsh? Yes. Okay. And please say the
Bye, Todd. We just uh, reconvene. Okay, we're going to reconvene now. Uh, next is the, we're going to back up to the financial statement. Steve? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we had a very active uh, month with uh, a meeting of the uh, Finance and Budget Committee, in addition to the normal things that we do here administratively in the finance and the clerk's office. So, uh, financial report for seven months ended July 31st, 22. Uh, this is already probably posted on the village website. If, if not, it will be after the meeting. Uh, as is uh, good governance, the financial statements were distributed to the mayor, the clerk, and council in advance of the council meeting. Uh, further, uh, several members of council, the mayor and the clerk, attended the August 3rd, 22 Finance and Budget Committee. Um, in summary, the village is in solid financial position. This is enabling it to address the economic pressures of inflation, rising costs, and supply chain disruptions without adversely impacting our service level to the villagers. That said, the village is not immune to the economic effects around us. And as a result, as was requested previously, uh, we have completed a review of our revenue expense levels for the second half of the year, and we'll report on those in a few minutes. The general fund, as of July, uh, the village received $463,000. Revenue from real estate taxes was, was 101,000 and revenue from municipal income taxes was 304,000. Year to date, real estate taxes collected are 1,470, 20,000 below prior year, 1,490. Year to date, municipal income tax revenue was 1,945,000, down from 21 when the village received a non recurring receipt of 2,000,001. Excluding that large receipt, the 22 figure of 1,945 is quite favorable. Overall, the tax receipts to date continue to be stronger than were budgeted in December of 22. We are fortunate that our municipal income taxes are running so favorable. I was reminded by someone that uh, when the long range plan committee was looking at these numbers just three years ago for the entire year, we were forecasting a million 750. And here we are in 22 through just July at, at uh, 1 million 945. Um, other revenue of uh, 411,000 for the seven months was 93,000 less than the prior year of 505,000. We had decreases in permits, licenses, interest income, the mills building rental income and miscellaneous income. Permits and licenses are a function of the building and commercial activity. Interest is down as expected. The mills building has gone through a change in tenants. And in 2021, the miscellaneous category included a Bureau of Workers Comp refund of $50,000. Expenditures were in good shape, $414,000 for the month and $3 million three for the year. It does include $451,000 of transfers from the general fund to other village special purpose funds. Departmental expenses of $414,000 of those expenditures to operate the village. Compared to the prior year to date, there were some notable differences. In administration, legal and professional services were doubled compared to last year. Income tax collection expense was down due to the lower receipts this year and personnel costs were up as were budgeted. The police department is generally in line with last year, except for higher personnel costs as was budgeted and higher gas costs. The dispatch operating costs are within 5,000 of budget. In the fire department, the EMS costs continue to run higher than budget. As a partial offset, we have been able to collect 30,000 in ambulance income this year compared to 7,000 in last year. The service department is running about 90,000 over last year's pace. Some of that was the tough winter weather and overtime in the first few months, a new air conditioner and building improvements to the mills building and vehicles. As you know, the books the village are maintained on a cash basis. There's a ver uh, variances and when receipts uh, come in and when expenses are paid, it's not uncommon to have a surplus in one month and a shortfall in a succeeding month. So the general funds in, in, uh, in solid shape and uh, we'll get to the outlook for the second half of the year in just a minute. We also covered um, at the Finance and Budget Committee, the American Recovery Plan Act Fund. So this is funds coming from the federal government, not from the CARES Act, which is what we got the last two years, but from the American Recovery, otherwise known as ARPA. Uh, the village received in July, the second and final receipt of the local fiscal recovery funds that were part of the American Recovery Plan Act. That brings our total cash collections to $233,000. These funds are available for a broad range of services and improvements, 
subject to government reporting, guidelines, and eventual audit. The ARPA funds need to be appropriated before the end of 2024 and spent before the end of 26. In the village, we have set a process at previous meetings that the Budget and Finance Committee would evaluate the possible uses of these funds, recommend those to council, and council makes the final decision, which is also consistent with this, what's in the ARP Act uh, as to the use of the funds. With the full amount now in hand, the village knows the amount available, and we've started to evaluate uh, different uses. Uh, we will see a resolution later today coming from Councilman Allwater, I believe, that um, uh, asks for uh, council approval for use of $72,000 of the ARPA funds for the comprehensive plan. Uh, that was the uh, one of the end results of the Budget and Finance Committee was that recommendation to council. On the conservation fund, um, again, this is the land conservancy uh, topic of last year. Uh, the village did distribute $61,981 to Gates Mills Land Conservancy as its 50% share of the tax and retain the other 50%. The village's conservation fund now stands at $71,000 on July 31st. I believe we committed to report to council on a semi-annual basis, so this is that report. I also saw on the agenda that uh, the Conservancy was gonna have a report. I don't know if that happened before I arrived or not. Uh, cash position, at the end of July, the village um, general fund was $7,952,000. Cash in the other funds was 1,567 for the total cash position of $9.5 million. We ended 21 and started 22 with a combined cash of $8,266,000. The village has no debt, as you know, and as a result, we are in a very strong financial position in these very uh, uncharted economic times. What's the second half look like? Um, the fair amount of conversation at the, at the Budget and Finance Committee meeting uh, prior to that uh, uh, time, um, I met with uh, Janet and with, the, with many of the department heads. We looked at uh, the variances that we were running um, and the uh, results we were running for the first six months of the year. We identified a number of areas where it looked like our costs could be higher as well as some areas where they could be lower. Uh, we put together an outlook and I presented that outlook to the Budget and Finance Committee. We had a very uh, good discussion for a better part of 45 minutes to an hour and we'll report those results here. Uh, we have taken a diligent look at the second half of 22. The Budget and Finance Committee met on August 3rd, reviewed the seven month numbers, evaluated variances, and discussed an outlook for the second half. Our income tax revenues continue to be stronger than expected, and Rita has advised us to expect that favorability to continue for 22. As a point of conservative, well, they actually gave us a range and we took the lower end of the range. They also indicated that that number they felt quite comfortable with and we should be able to rely on that number for the next couple of years. So it looks like this is not a blip. This is uh, in many cases an indication of more income tax revenue coming into the village, perhaps because of more villagers earning income, uh, individuals moving in to homes that maybe were, were occupied by people that maybe had retired or were Florida residents or lived here part-time. Um, we're gonna ask Rita more questions to see whether we can get a little more of that, of that answer, uh, but uh, they again felt quite comfortable with that recommendation. As a point of conservatism in these uh, times, we've reduced the estimates of two other revenue sources to be conservative. We also looked at all of our expenditures and we foresee the need for an additional 161,000 operating costs. Those costs are for gas, which we can all appreciate, legal and professional fees, insurance premiums, dispatch, and EMS. The additional 161,000 will bring the total for the year to 5,812,000, million eight, uh, five million eight hundred twelve thousand, an increase of 2.8%. So um, we will be running the village uh, very, I think very tightly and very well. Um, if those numbers come come in as we're planning, we should be within actually less than 3% of what we budgeted last December for the village in these times. As a result, the Budget and Finance Committee recommends Council's approval of Ordinance 22, I think it's now 2223. Um, the Finance and Budget Committee recommends that approval authorizing these additional costs. Overall, the outlook is that we'll receive, when you put all this together, we'll receive probably $175,000 more than budgeted and we'll spend $161,000 more than budgeted. 
in a village that operates roughly on a five and a half million dollar base, um, these uh, revenue expense figures are fairly modest. Finally, uh, we did talk about the levy renewal. It's important that we um, uh, recognize that we have a, a levy that comes up for renewal in November. It generates $450,000 of, of taxes uh, to the village. Uh, we believe that the financial and operating activities that the village has shown, including some transparency and leadership, uh, demonstrate good financial stewardship to the villagers as they consider the levy renewal. Um, we have posted this, Janet, or we'll post this on the village website tomorrow. So that concludes the formal uh, report and the formal remarks. Uh, I will say in addition to that, and we'll put together budget and finance committee minutes and, and have those posted uh, for you to see. Uh, we also had a good conversation at the, at the committee about the long range planning and uh, updating the financial schedules. Uh, we had put uh, forth a list of assumptions uh, that uh, I had uh, started with. So we had a starting point, share those with the committee members and had a good conversation. Several people have commented back on what kind of percentages they might expect. Uh, it's all good input. These are financial projections going out a number of years. Uh, we know that uh, uh, you know you have to have a starting point and then you have to have good conversations on, on, on what assumptions you're making and why and have them documented that way. Um, so overall that process, uh, will the way we're gonna do that going forward rather than convening a, 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 another long range planning committee, uh, Janet in the clerk's office and myself will take those financial assumptions. Uh, we'll take the numbers that we have. We'll take the comments of the people that uh, sent them to us and we'll create by October a first set of numbers of what kind of would be long range planning numbers. We'll meet again as a committee and then we'll have actual numbers to, to talk about. So start with the assumptions, use the raw data, have one set of numbers to start looking at. And from there, people can debate what, uh, what, they, what they see in the numbers. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions of council or others. Uh, Mayor, if I may, a couple of points. Um, we were originally talking about reviewing the five-year financial projection with council in the third quarter. October is now the fourth quarter. I, I hope it doesn't slip any further. Um, I was hoping that we would have a long-range financial perspective as a context for the long-range, uh, for the uh, comprehensive plan discussion. Uh, so that we could talk about whether we could afford the various things people were talking about on the financial side of the shop. So I hope it doesn't slip any further, but that October is what it is. Um, another thing, at the advisory committee meeting on uh, July the 15th, I think it was, uh, Mr. Simborski volunteered to give a, um, a financial presentation um, to brief people on where the money comes from and where it goes. Taxes. Uh, taxes as well. And um, I think that was a, a well received by the advisory committee and he volunteered that I would help him, which I certainly will. Um, I think that's an important piece of work, not just for council or for the advisory committee, but for everybody. And I remember three years ago, we did talk about having a village finance uh, town hall. Uh, that was all kiboshed by COVID, of course. I, th I still think that would be a great idea because people are talking about a lot of things in this comprehensive plan that are gonna cost money. And I think they need to understand how much we've got and where it comes from and where else it goes. Um, and right now, most people I talk to don't know. And therefore they're informed, their, their views are all ill-informed opinions. They might be right, but they're ill-informed. So I think this is a very important piece of work. And I wondered if the advisory committee had taken you up on your offer. Yeah, uh, they have both uh, Chip and Sandra gave me a ring. And so we are going to uh, I think be invited to the September advisory council right. yes. meeting. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, we have been invited. I mean, we have been asked, well, we've been asked to be invited. So, right. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a date yet for that meeting, but uh, you know, that's un un under underway whenever the meeting Great. is going to occur. Great. Thank you. That's all I had. Any other questions? Thank you, Steve. Next on the agenda is the police report. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, everyone should have received a copy of my monthly report. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> Good 
Okay. No questions. Thank you. Next is service department, Dave. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of council, you should have received a, a brief copy of my monthly report. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Do we think there's a chance you get the truck this year? I just, uh, <laughs> it's gonna be close. Um, I actually sent him an email today asking uh, how long their operational testing takes and uh, if he has any type of anticipated date we might receive the chassis. Uh, fortunately, as I said in my report, all the equipment for the truck we purchased in last year's budget. So the uh, equipment uh, company pretty much is ready to go as soon as we can get the chassis. So it, it's going to be close. So if we get a snowfall before this truck is here, are you going to have to be pushing the old plow truck <laughs> up Mayfield? Hill? Well, it, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll use the current truck, right? Yeah. The one we were, we're stretching, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, no other, okay. Just as a point of reference, you always include the planning and zoning commission minutes those were technically not approved because we didn't have a quorum. Uh, so so uh, okay. they're not approved. I don't know that they're gonna change, but we may have to. Okay, gotcha. Yep. No, the July yep, yep, yep. 5th minutes were not approved at the August, August. meeting. Correct, that's right. So both will be approved in September. Correct. Right. Yep. No other questions, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dave. Next is fire department, chief. Thank you, Mayor and members of council. You should have received a copy of the fire department report for July, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. 25th was extremely busy. <laughs> it was a catch-up. It was a catch-up two and a half hour period. We were kind of low on runs uh, for the month. We didn't get our first run until the 20th. So we had a, a pretty dry spell, and we don't like those because it all evens out. And <laughs> if you read the back of my report, you'll see, you know, basically the the work that was being done, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, uh, from a little past midnight till almost two thirty, of all the roads that we had closed, all the trees that came down. Uh, most people wouldn't even be aware of it because everything was cleaned up, and the roads were reopened. You know by 2.30 in the morning. Just so typical of our staff response, both fire and service, and I'm sure police, but I mean, it happened to be all around my house and it was just unbelievable, all the activity and how quickly you recovered. So my compliments. Thank you. That concludes the fire department. And, and as, as given your expertise on weather, it does look like it was almost a path. I mean, it wasn't a tornado, but it was it like a microburst or do we have any detail? Cause it's a mile away. There wasn't much of an impact, but. Yeah, I, I talked with our neighboring fire departments and uh, they slept through the night. You know, a, lot, <laughs> a lot of times we, we have the blessing of uh, the valley and it blows right across and I'll talk to Chesterland the day after and you know how to go for you guys and talk to the chief and he goes, we didn't go on any calls. Wow. So this time it, it got us, it dipped down and got us. Thank you, chief. Next on the agenda is resolution number 2022-22, Chip. Yes, this is a resolution authorizing the expenditure of local fiscal recovery funds to reimburse revenue expended to date for professional services provided by CT consultants under agreement for the village's comprehensive plan and to fund ongoing expenditures to CT consultants under that agreement. The total amount that we are asking for is 72, well, it'll be in the next resolution, but 72,000, um, uh, I thought it was 70, yeah, there it is, 72,000. Um, and again, the discussion at the finance committee was this is allowed and appropriate under the uh, fiscal, the uh, federal recovery funds. Um, and the thinking is that um, let's use it, uh, some of it, 
uh, for a legitimate purpose. This is a one-off purpose. Um, obviously, we're not going to do this every year, and uh, the committee felt that this was an appropriate use, and thus we're asking for approval. So I need a motion, or I just made a motion. I move, I guess. Second. Suspend. I need to, I need a motion to suspend the rules. Second. Okay. Atten. Assume. Auditor. Yes. Press. Yes. Steinbrink. Yes. Turner. Yes. Welsh. Yes. Now a motion to approve. And I, I move to approve. Resolution 2022-22. Second. Question? Atten. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we're just putting in here the money we expect to pay. We haven't paid it yet. We're expecting to pay to CT consultants. This is your estimate for the total project, right? The CT Correct. Project. We're also spending, I would guess, mounting number of dollars in other ways on the comprehensive plan. All this printing, so all that. Can that be included in this as well? I should have thought of this at the first. Um, we think that that, well, this is for CT consultants. Alone. That's That's going to be a couple of hundred dollars of postage here and there, maybe a thousand dollars in total. Um, we could come back and ask for that. This was a simple, this is the estimate for CT. It's not that material. I, I agree with you. It sounds like a lot, but it's, you know, this, this flyer was $200 to get all that done, et cetera. So I, I don't think it's much, maybe it's 2000, but, and we could add that later at a different expenditure. Sure. I talked to Janet about that. So good question. Any other questions? Atten? Yes. Alwarder? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? Yes. Welsh? Yes. Thank you. Next is Ordinance 2022-23. This is an ordinance to amend the annual appropriation ordinance for 20, uh, number 2021-50 to increase certain appropriations and other expenditures of the Village of Gates Mills Ohio for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022. So this is, it's not housekeeping, but it does move money from the general fund. It appropriates more money than what we originally budgeted as Steve Zimborski commented. Um, while this is some increase in expenses versus budget, again, as Steve indicated, we're, we're running uh, ahead on the revenue side. So, um, so it, it's not, uh, doesn't mean that we're going to be worse off on the bottom line at the end of the year, but uh, these are all, um, there's various reasons for each of these that were covered in the finance committee, um, but uh, we need to get this approved now so that uh, uh, Janet can keep keep paying the bills and, and pay them out of the appropriate funds. So I might, I might add also, when we set the budgets, we were relatively uh, tight um, you know, we saw inflation, we talked about rising costs, we talked about competitiveness of our salaries, we made some changes there to be competitive, um, and we asked the department heads to to tighten their belts a bit, and, and they did. And uh, the expectation always is that when you do that, there may be a need to come back when something happens uh, or uh, time goes on. Gasoline prices are $5 a gallon versus $3.50 a gallon a year ago. So, uh, you know, I, I really uh, see this as, as, as somewhat expected if you're going to hold to a tight budget, not so tight that you're choking things, but tight enough that you're conscious about your cost. Don't be surprised when someone comes back and says, I need a little bit more for the following reasons. And all those reasons uh, we went through with the department heads. Right. Thank now, you. let me build, and not to get too specific here, but for example, Section 7, that that the appropriation for the park recreation fund be increased by $20,000. Well, that's for the sidewalk that was put in across from uh, uh, the mills building and the like, a great addition to the village. And actually that's been funded almost entirely by donations, but the Janet can't issue the funds for this to pay for that expense, even though we've got revenue to offset it without an appropriation. So this sounds like it's a $20,000 overrun, whereas in fact, I think by the time all the money comes in, it's not really an overrun at all, but this is the way the bookkeeping has to be done. That's an, that's an example. So, so obviously in some areas, as Steve said, these are cost overruns and others, it's, it's the way we have to account for the books. So, so is that the way section eight works as well? Uh, yes. That it's not coming out of the- Correct. That's the they, general fund from- 
the ARPA fund? The general fund, the general fund has spent certain of those dollars to the consultants. Those monies will be reimbursed from the ARPA fund. From the ARPA fund. fund. Okay. Correct. That's right. Thanks. So I move to suspend the rules. Second. Patton? Yes. Allwarder? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? Yes. Welsh? Yes. I now move to approve res our ordinance 2022-23. Second. Patton? Yes. Allwarder? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? Yes. Welsh? Yes. Thank you. Next is resolution number 2022-24. Chip? Yes. This is a resolution awarding a contract for the repair and resurfacing of various public roads in 2022 and declaring an emergency. So I, you have a handout in front of you of two documents, front, front and printed front and back. I would actually uh, like you to start with the detailed schedule that's got all the print on it. Fine. Okay. 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 Um, thank you. Um, what I have done here is gone back to the PCM report that we've reviewed a couple of months ago um, and pulled out all of the failed roads. And remember, that's a PCI index below 30. And all of the poor roads, which is a PCI index between 30 and 49. And this is all of the failed and poor roads. Now, if anybody was really had studied every line item in the report, you might ask where SOM Center is on this. And the reason SOM Center isn't on this report, it's rated as poor, is because the county or the state or whatever is doing SOM Center right now. Um, we have a little bit of support uh, expenditure for that for some of the side elements, but uh, that road will obviously be improved. So I've taken it off because it's already being addressed and not at our expense. So um, now what I've highlighted on here is um, what we're going to be proposing today uh, is these what's slight yellow, Carpenter, Chartley, Chartley, two different sections of Chartley, Norville Circle East and West, which are in particularly bad shape, as are those sections of Chartley and Carpenter, which I reminded everybody to take a look at that if you had a chance. I think several of you did. And then you can hardly see it, but down below, there's a poor road for a poor section of Chartley um, that's about two thirds of the way down. And obviously when you're working on Chartley, you wanna do the whole thing, not stop. So that, that would be more costly than it'd be worth. So, um, so uh, what you're going to see in the proposal when we turn the page over is that we're going to address uh, a lot of our failed roads if we were to approve what what was uh, on the table for tonight. That would mean um, next year or the year after we could begin to address uh, Andrews Lane or Blackberry Lane or Chestnut Run and hopefully knock off the failed roads uh, fairly quickly. Um, the other principal point here is the concept that when you start to work on a road, you ought to deal with the roads that are nearby. So um, in this case, uh, we'll talk about uh, in future years how we can address the failed roads. But for example, if we went and worked on Blackberry Lane, which is in the north east corner of the village, um, we would probably want to work on some of the other roads out there that would be in relatively poor shape. Uh, rather than run all the way over and do Andrews Lane at the same time, which is quite far apart. So, so I've tried to start to map out with Chris some different sections. Uh, once we work in this area, let's address some of these others uh, and map that out over the next five years. Um, this schedule also, and the numbers are fairly conservative on here, but if you go all the way to the bottom of the schedule, to if we were to address all of our failed roads and our poor roads over the next five years, we would need to average for this type of road, the poor and failed, around 630,000 a year in expense. Now that's not to include the county roads and the regular maintenance and does not include uh, culverts and the like. So um, this is just something that we're gonna work on and try to feed into the long range plan. Um, 
I will tell you the numbers here have already were adjusted just today because uh, Chris has digested the bids. Obviously, we're going to go through those. And uh, the bids came in considerably better, about 18% better than Chris thought they would, um, which is good news. <laughs> uh, but they are up about 30% from a year ago. Um, but we thought they might be much worse from some of the stories we were hearing. So these numbers are a little better than even what, what we were looking at, Chris and I, last week. So that's background. Now, if you flip over to the front page, this is the proposal now specifically related to this ordinance of the roads that we want to pave <clears throat> or redo and puts it into the context of our budget for uh, capital expenditure for uh, the roads and culverts and the like. So I've broken this into uh, road maintenance, which is section one, two, and three. Uh, remind you that the county road maintenance, this is the full cost um, of that. That's 195,000 of road work. And then I used a straight percentage for the engineer, roughly 13%. Uh, engineering fee that may be differ by the individual roads, but that was the ballpark that uh, Chris suggested. Um, so of the 195,000, about half of that will be reimbursed by the county. Um, and in 2022, we hope to be getting close to 100,000 from last year's county work. Um, and then next year, if we were to spend this, <laughs> we'd hope to get, you know, what would be close to 100,000 for this year's program. But this is the gross amount. Um, now we're technically approving the work and approving the bid, uh, the 195,000 for the road work, and then the engineering would go along with that, obviously. <laughs> so we're approving that this level of, of expenditure is likely to, to complete those roads. The local roads, the preventive maintenance, um, that's the uh, um, the the crack sealing, the, uh, um, the spray that we put on to preserve, and some of that, and the local road spot repairs. That's a little bit of mill and fill, not a little bit, ninety or eighty-five thousand of mill and fill on uh, key spots uh, and troubled spots around the village. Um, that all adds up to three hundred and seventy-five thousand three thirty, um, and then to address the poor or failed roads to do the full depth repair, which is very good. The whole road will be, be stripped. The whole road will be repaved. Um, that's to do Norville East, which is a PCI of 929, a Norville West, which is in particularly bad shape. That is actually our worst road in the whole village, according to the PCI index. Um, and then to do Chartley. Um, it was mentioned to me that given that our mayor lives on Chartley, maybe this isn't very appropriate, but I will remind you that uh, two of our six worst road uh, conditions are on Chartley. This has nothing to do with the mayor, obviously. In fact, this has been on the agenda for a couple of years. And of course, while we're working on those two sections, we should work on the third section, uh, which is in poor condition, not, not failed. And then Carpenter, which is in particularly bad shape. So that collectively is 430,000. Now um, we could, you'll see to the right, option one is to not do Carpenter, but once we're in Norville East and West, it makes a whole lot of sense to do Chartley. Again, get three of those or four sections of very failed roads. Um, and obviously to continue with our maintenance and, and all of the above. Um, scenario two, which I've highlighted, is what I am recommending. Would we include Carpenter? And then there's additional scenario, which is to add Dorchester. Uh, note that the PCI for Dorchester is 55. Well, that's that's a fair condition, not poor, not failed. Um, and what I reason part reason I showed you the other side of the page is we've got a lot of poor roads and some failed roads yet to address. And while I'm sure that Dorchester would be nicer if we if we spent this money, I would rather personally recommend that we not wait to that money, that we keep saving our ammunition each year for addressing our poor and failed roads. And then if we're in the area and we feel we have enough money, that maybe we do some more. But um, now, uh, one correction, as you go down the side, technically the bids came in by section number. And Carpenter, I, I, I mislabeled this. Carpenter is section eight and Dorchester is section seven. So just as a correction to that schedule. 
Now, for final reference, the 2022 budget for all of the road work was 635,000. If we went with scenario one, it would be 676,000, a little bit more. If we went with scenario two, it would be 805,000. And if we went with scenario three, which would include Dorchester, it would be 971. Again, the reason to put Dorchester is it's obviously right next door to, to Chartley and while you're in the area. Now, I reviewed with Dave Biggert and Chris where we are on our culverts and sewers and other. And um, the estimate at the moment is we will clearly spend about 30,000. I didn't make the note on that here, but we budgeted 135,000. Um, and uh, the question is how much more? Now, Dave would tell you that we could walk out of this meeting tonight and tomorrow morning a culvert could collapse. That certainly can happen. Um, at where we are at this point, there is absolutely nothing on the horizon. And um, so I, put in a provision that maybe we could come in 50,000 less. That's not a guarantee. It's a, it's a, now if, if a culvert collapsed in you know, December or January, that bill probably hits in, in January or February. So we have five and a half months left, um, four and a half months left to, uh, to see where we come out. But just to give you a rough sense, this is a reasonable estimate that um, we might come in at 85,000 for that area. Um, 890,000, which would put us 120,000 over budget. Um, I'll give you a personal comment. Steve's uh, report from the Finance Committee was a very prudent and sound report, but I think he'd be the first to say there is some conservative element. We could come in even higher on the uh, income tax revenue line. Um, we might get the county money late this year. You never know when we get it. So, um, so I'm suggesting, given how much of a Hill we have to climb over the next five years that we bite off more than budget this year, uh, 805,000 versus the 635, and hope that we don't come in as high on the culverts and the sewers. So that is the background, um, certainly open to questions. We could even talk about whether you'd wanna do Dorchester this year or push that out, or whether you'd wanna do Carpenter this year or push that out. Um, and uh, and after that discussion, then go for uh, suspend the rules on 2022-24. Chip, I, I noticed there's um, in, in the resolution here that the commentary is this asphalt surface recycling. Yes. I think based on the last council meeting, there was some discussion. And Chris, I thought you were going to go visit some of that. Maybe if you've got an update. Notice that they better sharpen their pencils a lot if they were going to get the work for this year's road program. And I think that's effectively what happened. We saw asphalt prices per ton here in Jake Mill that were 15, 20% lower than did we saw in other communities for our low bidder. Um, so I think wow. we forced some good competition uh, upon them and they reacted well uh, from our standpoint which allows us to uh, get for essentially the budget that I had, the estimate that I had to do the asphalt surface recycling method uh, for all the roads was $840,000. Um, the low bid came in using traditional methods at $859,000. So they're only about $19,000 over my estimate for the recycling method. The recycling method was actually more expensive on two roads, on the bigger roads, on Dorchester and Chartley, uh, than it was the traditional method. So I think it's a win. I think it's a big win for the village. Thanks. So to clarify, you aren't going to be recommending the use of recycling in this in this correct. This is full depth repair. That's great. This is full depth repair. I should have mentioned that. Great. Sorry. Yes. Great. And of course the budget was struck when asphalt prices were a good deal lower. Very true. Uh, so uh, so it's amazing that you've you've come so close to budget. Um in an environment where the prices of asphalt must be astronomic these days, crude oils at $120. Uh, earlier this year, David, were double 
what asking yeah. prices yeah. were last year. Yeah. In this instance, they're uh, as Chip estimated about thirty three about thirty three percent higher than what we yeah. looked at. So yeah. we we, uh, we we got some good prices. Fine. And you're recommending scenario two, are you, Jim? Yeah, I, I just, um, and not that I don't love Dorchester and all the people that live on it. I'm just trying to save, you know, our money to address the poor roads is our highest priority. And um, I just, uh, a road that's at 55 on the PCI, I keep trying to drive these roads and say, what was I just on a 14 or a 30 or a 60? But it makes it, seriously, it's helpful to do that. Carry it around as you drive on them and say, well, this road was in bad shape. And I run back and I look it up and says, yeah, I haven't, I haven't found any inconsistency from just a you know a, a novice looking at the PCI versus the condition of the road, it makes sense. So, I, I again happy to you know the, this is a pretty good bid. It is up from from prior year. We know even with the retraction in oil prices, and this is favorable compared to earlier in the year. We're still at relatively high asphalt prices, so maybe not a time to to be too ambitious. Um, but open for discussion. Whether I, I'm just making a recommendation. That's the we have complete discretion to say we'll go with option one or option two or option three or any other variation, but that's that's what I'm recommending. Yeah. There are questions, Steve? I was just going to add, uh, I like option two. I, I like the analysis. Um, normally, you'd say, why would you want to spend more than you have budgeted? We've kind of already gone through that. I think on, on top of this analysis, uh, we have not factored in the 115000 that we will get back eventually in 23, it may take us eight or nine months the way the county reimburses. But if you took the 120,000, that's currently the bracketed number in your column two and subtracted the 115,000 that we will get back up to 115,000 and the county costs, that really gets us down to kind of break even. Um, okay, I, a way I, to I may be it. wrong, but the 635,000 doesn't include the, Hundred thousand that we budgeted to get back from last year, so I didn't want to mix and match. So right. the six thirty-five was the full amount from the county, right? And that's so apples to apples. That's why I put the eight hundred and five. Yeah. So, so I I think that's legitimate because Janet indicated. Oh, I, that I in, yeah, I, I don't the I other revenue. I think, I think the schedule is good. I think it's actually conservative. I think what we're in essence saying is we could either use you know, the money that we're going to get, we should get in November, December from last year that the county reimburses, let's just say 10 months later than it's spent and use that because we took it out of our forecast. We looked at our outlook. If right. Know. Yes. Yes. We or did take it out. Look yes. at it and say, right. we're fortunate as a village to have enough cash to pay for this up front. The county's 115 will come back to us next year. And that would reduce the cost really of 22, even though right. you're getting 23. I know it's the way we have to account for it. I, 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 I get that. Yes. Thank you. Good point. Any other questions? So um, I, I want to suspend the rules first, and then I will make a specific motion that we approve scenario two, and I'll detail that. But first, I move to suspend the rules. Second. Patton? Yes. All order? Yes. Press? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Turner? Yes. And now I move to approve. Resolution 2022-24, and more specifically, Section 1, Section 2, Section 3, Section 4, Norville East, Section 5, Norville West, Section 6, Chartley, and Section 8, Carpenter, um, for an estimated cost of around 805440 including the engineering fees associated. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Can you repeat that? Seven twelve, seven seventy nine. Thank you. Seven twelve, seven ninety nine. Thank you. You're right. That's that's technically what we're approving. Thank you. So that's the motion. I ask for approval. Second. Second. Atten? Yes. All order. Yes. Um, uh, I'm a yes as well. Uh, I would prefer if we can avoid doing the roads uh, where members of council live until we've done the other roads. But uh, if that can't be done, then by all means, I'm a yes. Quite a penalty for, for those of us that live on roads in the village. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. Steinbrink? Yes. Turner? 
Yes, Welsh. Yes. Thank you. Next, uh, council matters. Anything else that would like to be I've brought got, up? I've got one, Karen. Uh, as I reported back in July, the day before the July council meeting, I had breakfast with Sean Riley. Uh, for those in the audience, Sean is former mayor, runs a law firm, and signed the original Sarah's lease. Sean agrees that Sarah's is in default of the lease right now with respect to the provision on operating hours. He agrees that we need to assert our rights. And he and I both agree that it should be done in the form of a love note uh, so as not to uh, further fan the fires with Dave and Mary. Uh, no action has been taken on this matter since the July meeting. So I would uh, like to propose I guess it would be resolution 2022-25. Janet, would you be kind enough to read it? Um, I don't think we can do a resolution this way. Yeah, we can't do it this way without the law director uh, being involved in it. You had said it would be a motion when you sent it. Okay, we'll call it a motion then. Doesn't have to be a resolution. Motion is just fine. Would you be happy to do the honors, Janet? Um, I'd prefer you read it. If you were All right. I'll read it. Okay, remember, we're trying for a love note here for obvious reasons. Whereas Sarah's Place is a valuable and highly regarded restaurant located in the village of Gates Mills. Whereas Sarah's Place elected to discontinue serving lunch due to COVID, and that remains the status to date. Whereas Sarah's Place is in violation of the terms of the lease with the village of Gates Mills, which requires them to be open and in operation from 11 o'clock in the morning until 10 at night. Whereas council wishes to preserve their rights with respect to the terms of the Sarah's Place lease while retaining a good relationship with Sarah's Place, council agrees as follows. Gavi's LLC will be notified in writing they're currently in default of the terms of the lease with respect to the provision regarding hours of operation. Gavi's will be allowed to continue to operate in violation of the terms of the lease temporarily. The Village of Gates Mills reserves the right to enforce the terms of the lease relating to hours of operation on 30 days notice. So it allows them to continue doing exactly what they're doing now it just asserts the fact that they are in violation and we can we can put them on notice that, uh, whenever we wish. All it does is preserve our rights under the lease. If I could make a point of clarification, you represented that Sean agrees that they're in violation and agrees that they should be cited. I've happened to have conversations with Sean and that's not my interpretation of what he said. So I'd rather we leave Sean without his ability to be here to speak leave him out of this discussion. It sounds like he's adding credence to this. That's not my understanding. I think he was technically saying, yeah, they might technically be, but I don't think he's supporting anything like this. He may be, he's not I, here. I to don't know that, Chip, so. whether he's supporting it or not. I think perhaps he's in the not column, but he definitely agrees that they're in violation. He definitely agrees that we need to uh, assert our rights. For him, it's a question of no. timing, nothing more. No, no, he didn't. He didn't. He said we could, but he didn't agree that we definitely need to. I don't know that he's, but I just don't think we should represent him that way. And, yeah. you know, without him here, I'm sorry, that's all. I'm, you know, you're saying one thing and I'm just saying another. And without him here, we don't really know. So um, I have had a very clear conversation with him in my mind, and it's a little different than yours. And maybe you're right. Mm -hmm. It's just I had a different interpretation. So is there even a second? Sorry, what was that? We're having a discussion, but there hasn't been a second. I seconded. You did? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I didn't. I will do. So you you can have the motion is made by Mike, referencing a con a meeting with Sean. Sean gets left out of it from that standpoint. That's fine. We don't know his opinion here. That wasn't part of the motion, actually. That was part of the background leading up the motion. Okay. There is no reference in the mo in the motion to uh, Sean. Absolutely. Would this be on first reading? No, this is a motion. You would vote right now. Atten. 
I'd yeah. like to, I have a question oh. or comment. Okay. Um, th this is a real estate matter um, and no one from the real estate committee has, um, has offered this. This comes from a, a member of council, which is perfectly fine and we could vote on it. Um, I'm not supporting the, the motion because no one from the real estate committee is, uh, is involved in, in this. Okay. If the real estate committee were doing their job, there wouldn't be a need for me to make the motion. They would have made it themselves. Maybe. This is contract administration 101. If, you, if, your, if your partner is in breach, you tell him. You reserve all your legal we're rights. Allowed, the we're terms allowing of the him to continue to be in breach. <clears throat> Dave and, I don't think Dave and Mary have a problem with this. Dave and Mary, excuse I, me. I don't see how this motion in any way changes the uh, existing contract, which could at any point be, um, be the question could be called, so well, to speak. So I don't I, see how this enhances well, what Senator, we have. Let me, let me explain that, as Sean explained it to me. Uh, if you have a provision in a contract and the other party is not, in in compliance with that provision and you allow it to go on you lose your right if you don't assert your right you lose your right to enforce that provision for all time okay i again i don't n know that that the real estate committee has or hasn't done that well, well i've I, certainly I, talked to everybody on the real estate committee about it well i'm not uh i'm not an attorney and i'm not going to speak for the real estate uh committee but I, I i will speak for myself i've had um a number of conversations with dave and mary regarding lunch service um dave and mary uh attempted to put um 12 tables back into sara's uh that lasted three days and the tables were pulled back out um because of um customer concerns over the close spacing of the tables uh, that were in there. Uh, as I've said in meetings before, you can go into Shrigan Falls at JoJo's. You can go to other places in Shrigan Falls that are not open for lunch because they cannot find anybody to work for lunch. Um, so if this were uh, a normal environment and uh, Dave and Mary just decide to stop serving lunch for, for no apparent reason, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, maybe this would be worth having a discussion, uh, but it, but at this point in time, and, and given where where things stand, um, I, I, I I don't know what we're trying to accomplish. Um, Greg, with by, all due, re with all due respect, effectively we're, we're, we're pissing we're off the largest the tenant in the village. We're allowing them oh. to continue not serving lunch. That's, that's the point so, of the. So that that's fine, and we'll we'll mark this meeting. Dave and Mary move out when their lease is up in three years, and they don't renew. Mm -hmm. I will go back to this meeting. Um, and this will be case 1A of why they moved out of the village. 1B, you made the same point last month. Um, Michael, you are technically correct in contract, you know, that if, if you allow a continued violation. So I do think we have to be mindful of that. But that doesn't mean that you just do a draft and send it to them and say, here, I think you have discussions, you understand the situation. And rather than reserving this, maybe we have to come to grips with maybe they can't afford to do lunch. And rather than piss them off and force them out of here, we try to understand their situation. And, and that could be a reasonable role of the real estate committee. And I wouldn't mind advising through Craig that, that they have a little more in-depth discussion about, let me fully understand about whether you could or couldn't do lunch, what it really amounts to. If there's just no chance of it, you know, I do agree. There are other restaurants you can go to. I went to one today and had lunch. So people are serving lunch. Um, so I am a little confused why I used to have lunch at SARS and I don't want to just give up on it. On the other hand, I don't want to put a gun to their head and say, just be aware that we're ready to, to call you in violation at any time we want to. I hang don't on, like that. Hang so. on. I'm allowing them to continue to operate as they are. They have had a certain amount of pressure from the village to open for lunch. And they're unhappy about that, I understand. Uh, and uh, this will end all that. Well, you know, you put it in a positive light and if they were in agreement and understood and didn't, didn't view it in a negative, then I could come around to supporting it. I don't know that yet. And I guess I'd like to hear that. I don't disagree that if we don't do anything that a year from now, we could be hard pressed to say, by the way, we're calling you in violation because we would have allowed it well, to it go on. 
they're certainly not here to object to the motion. They're aware of it. Oh, I guess I'd like to hear a little more. So I, I, I'm kind of in a quandary because I'd like to see him have lunch, but I'd like to understand more if that's even possible and if so, but I not, don't want to piss him off. It's not about having lunch. It's about asserting our rights into the contract and letting him continue not to have lunch. I think we ought to have let them know that this was coming. They do know. I notified their attorneys before the meeting in so that they could show up and speak for themselves if they chose to. And I don't think that's the way I'd like to see things conducted with a valuable, our best tenant in the village. I, I don't think. I, I so don't... we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, we can vote on it. And uh, that's where we are. Very good. And, and from the real estate sorry. committee's perspective, it would have been nice to have known that you were going to spring this at the meeting tonight and also that you would notified our largest tenant in the village, their attorneys, that you were sending this information. Uh, I, I, I doubt Sean and Warren uh, and certainly myself had no idea this was uh, going on. So Agreed. Could, could I make a comment, please? I, I think there are lots of questions that this council should be dealing with with respect to how real estate decisions are taken in the, in the village. Um, the, the governance aspects of the real estate discussions are very weak. I don't think the um, uh, real estate committee has posted a meeting, uh, had a public meeting, or issued minutes for six months. And I don't think that's appropriate. I think you made a, a, a statement last council meeting, Karen, that you were responsible for administering real estate contracts, that you had the administrative responsibility. You do but you also delegate some of that to council. And I, it's not clear to me when it's delegated to council and when it isn't. For example, this letter that Michael is proposing should have been sent to them very early on in this whole process without offense, just protecting your rights, which as a contract administrator is your responsibility. Uh, and you administer the contracts. The real estate committee doesn't. They bring in new contracts, not old ones. I brought it up last last month because I talked to Sean. We both agreed it should be done. And a month's gone by. And, and Sean no usually brings the contract information to me. Now, this he did not bring to me. Whatever, nothing's happened. Somebody has to do something to exert our, to protect our rights. I'm gonna call the question. Vote. Janet. Oh, I'm sorry. Atten? Yes. Allwarder? No. Press? Yes. Steinbrink? No. Turner? No. Welsh? Abstain. Uh, okay. I don't know that he can. You don't have a can conflict. Add, I don't think And I'm not sure that. Uh, Dave and Mary are good friends of ours. And they've been there for 20 years. I, well, you, I think can't, you have to vote yes or, or no, then. We, we need no. a vote from you. Okay, vote. He votes no. Are there any other council matters? I thought I had abstained on the basis he had a conflict because he knew them. Well, well, we all know, know a lot of people know that. Well, he knew them particularly well. You're right. We all know. Them. Well, I don't actually. Okay. It didn't pass. Is there anything else to be brought up, council matters? Uh, no, but I think Ed's vote ought to be an abstention, not a no. Um, I can check. I, I actually would like to bring up one thing: the round rock around the clock. Um, all of those of us that attended the uh, the band concert, uh, the sense was, and having read the survey results, uh, people would like more ability to come to Village Center and engage and be involved with the community. And we have that event coming up. I'd like to suggest that that be expanded maybe a food truck maybe maybe make it more than just stand around the beautiful clock thank you mayor no we have the band coming we're putting the dance floor out we'll put tables oh, okay. out oh. we have an ice cream truck coming so oh it's okay i didn't i didn't know any of that okay good good can you bring dinner will there be tables and chairs if you want if you chose you to... sure we can put tables and chairs i, I think out we encourage happen. that kind of thing sure. maybe even a food truck i don't know but that'd be uh, good you got the dance floor in the band right yes I don't want to waste time, but why are we talking about clocks? Uh, I thought I, I, <laughs> I, read thought I was deep. crazy the other day. I, I thought there were two clocks in the village, and there are. There's the one you've been talking about, and there's the one on the post office. So what are we going to do with the one on the post office? It's always <laughs> wrong. Um, 
and it looks kind of stupid. Um, either you fix it or you take it down. Um, and people are going to be saying that clock isn't right because the new one is right. You know, that's correct. <laughs> so I wasn't crazy. There are two clocks. No, I, we right. own both of them. Yes, we do. Good point. So I suggest we take one down, the little one. Good point. Good point. I, 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 I like, I like Steve's comment on that, though. We'll... <laughs> I'm going to move to uh, adjourn. <laughs> Wait a minute. Business, Business from, the from the audience. Oh, sorry. Oh, my <laughs> I mean, you have people see <laughs> with. Please. They've been waiting this long. Please. Please. Chip. Okay, so the cell tower committee. Yeah. Uh, name and <laughs> name, please, and address oh, for the it. minutes. Greg Amaro. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. So the Gilmore is kind of like put on hold. Is that correct? No, 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 the opposite. No. The, we had identified another spot if Gilmore wasn't going okay. to allow it. Okay. And so that's on hold because it sounds like. Okay. You always want one carrier to be the lead dog, and Verizon's most likely, and now they're starting to step up. So we're going to watch, watch that play out. We don't want to slow that down if okay. we can get there. So then I remember, you know, months back, you were talking about uh, the potential for two towers. Is that possibly, correct? yes. So I just, I need to say this. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I want to make sure that you are aware of it. Um, cell towers are actually carcinogenic. I understand the reason why uh, people, particularly in the West Hill area, need or feel they need additional cell towers because of poor reception. I can't recall the exact year, but the lobbyists were successful at ceasing, terminating all government funded cell tower safety studies in the United States, in the corrupt United States of America. So if you want any research, you've got to go outside of the United States of America, which I have done, peer-reviewed journals. They are extremely carcinogenic. And I hope that the committee is going to consider that before moving forward with cell towers in this village, because there are children in this village and children are more susceptible uh, to carcinogens than any other class of people because of their rapidly de uh, developing bodies. So I would hope that on the cell tower committee, there is at least a physician and perhaps maybe a, a physicist or somebody with a, you know, a PhD with advanced uh, scientific knowledge who can read the studies that are from other countries. Okay, I'll take that under advisement. I'm not aware of that, so. Yeah. Thank you, anyone else? Chip over here was talking about reforestation. I thought when we were having this comprehensive plan, that was the sort of stuff we would be talking about. I moved to Gates Mills 10 years ago. Speak for, into the microphone. Mark. Yeah, I moved to Gates Mills 10 years ago for three simple reasons. I wanted a safe place. I wanted a private place, okay? And I, and I wanted the natural beauty and the wildlife and the parks and all that. We hired a comprehensive plan, whatever they are, organization who have, and, and none of us are stupid here. They have narrowed the discussion to two things. Are we gonna build cluster homes and narrow the amount of property, the, the lot size. Don't look perplexed. I mean, it's been it's been pretty obvious in the meetings I've gone. And the second thing is, are we going to bring in real realty here? Are we going to have little strip malls somewhere? Um, I have to say, as somebody who grew up in a very famous community, some of you may have heard of it. It's called Flatbush in Brooklyn. And I lived in East Flatbush, which was a 20 square block area that produced three Nobel Prize winners and Sandy Koufax, who pitched for the, for the Dodgers. And in the space of five to 10 years, the realtors, along with our original uh, equity and diversity mayor, John Lindsay, took a beautiful, lower middle class, safe community with functioning public schools and destroyed it. There is no more destructive group to a community than realtors. And I don't have to tell you this, 
Realtors make their money by flipping houses. They don't give a damn about the short term, the medium term, or the long term outcome for a community. So I would like to know what I'm perplexed is who decided that 50 realtors would be part of this comprehensive plan. Now, if I hired 50 hockey players, they would probably suggest that we need a hockey rink, okay? Whoever suggested the 50 realtors had an idea in mind and probably instructed this comprehensive plan group that you have to go along with this idea. This is crooked. This is, this is how stuff gets stuck in bills in Congress that have nothing to do with the bills. I don't know, and I've never been told, how the 50 realtors got to be part of it. I don't know what instructions were given to these comprehensive planners, um, but I do know that I would rather there be 50 ecologists or 50 naturalists than 50 realtors. I, I, I'm telling you, I saw as a child, my neighborhood go from a, a lower middle class at best neighborhood where kids could stay out till three in the morning with nothing happening to them to a neighborhood where my grandfather who owned a little bodega was pistol whipped five times and the last time was stuck up at gunpoint. The other thing is I lived for 20 years across the street from Beachwood Mall. Now, I know that they're not gonna propose a mall because that would be way too much. But um, I think it was actually Chip who said, we didn't have a great website to attract people like other communities do. Well, 20 years ago, Beachwood put out a magnificent magazine. That was before the internet became big. And I still can see it today. There was a big cover on that magazine that said world-class shopping. And it had a picture of the grand piano in front of Saks Fifth Avenue. Well, today, in the last two and a half years, there have been six shootings in the, either in the mall or in the parking lot. I have 10 grandchildren that live within a mile and a half of that mall, and none of them are allowed to go in that mall without an adult, and none of the adults go after six o'clock at night, okay? There are, the mayor of Cleveland went to the chief of police of Beachwood, who used to be, who the former chief of police, who was a friend of mine, and asked him if he could get control of the mall because so many drug deals were being done in the mall and those drugs were winding up in Cleveland. Okay, we need more realty here. Like, we, like I need another hole in the head. Pinecrest, which is probably something akin to what your consultants are gonna recommend, has had two major riots in the last year. The first one with 100 youth, from none of whom were from the community, but who tore the crap out of the place, beat up people. And the second one, after they passed the same rules that the mall did with no one under 17 without an adult and all that, that was supposed to help. Six weeks later, a thousand youth appeared and trashed the Marriott and the winery. And now people are looking to get out. People who bought those expensive condos in Pinecrest, they can't wait to get out, okay? I don't, I don't know who decided that this was the discussion we were gonna have about this community, but this business, I, I, we need to have discussions about reforestation. We have, need to have discussions about, there are poor seniors who are being crushed by this inflation in our community. My wife and I buy food for two of them. You're pissing away $75,000 on a bunch of urban studies majors who have three years of experience to tell us what to do in, with our community. Okay, I think there's a conflict of interest somewhere. Someone should tell us how many people on the council and how many people on the anointed 27 have connections to real estate either themselves, their relatives, or their business? How many people have connections 
to proposed realty or development, something's not right. Something doesn't smell right here. I've, I've been through this twice, not just in East Flatbush. And, and I don't like what's going on here. I like Gates Mills as it is. Okay, if we're gonna do stuff, let's do stuff like Chip was talking with reforestation. But if you're gonna stick a pine crest in here, after I, I, we've seen what's gone on with every other mall on the east side, okay? You've been to Richmond Mall lately? Have you been there? Have you been to Beechwood Mall lately? I don't like this crap. I'd like to respond to two comments that you made. First of all, I recommended we engage outside perspectives. We did not get opinions from realtors. The realtors gave us the insights of what the buyers looking at houses are looking for, not the opinion of realtors. And we were very clear on that. I'm very disappointed. No. It Yes. Well, thank you for your opinion. I guess you were there for every one of those interviews. Now, secondly, I hear your sentiment. You have zero faith in 27 residents of our village that represent a complete cross section. I, maybe there are, I don't think so. That had nothing to do with how they were selected. And your, your uh, belief that this whole thing is geared towards a pine crest in the center of our village could not be further from the truth. So I don't know where you're getting all this. I pick this up occasionally because we're evaluating where we are. And as it said in the last plan meeting that we want to make sure that the village is attractive for the current resident and for future residents. We're trying to explore all of that. I think you should watch the process out, output over the next five meetings and then see. There is no underlying objective. There's no foregone conclusion. That is exactly the opposite. We're being as objective as possibly we can be here, get input from the villagers, understand where we are as a village. And if there's anything we should be thinking about doing, let's bring it up. That's what the advisory committee is chartered with. Then it becomes council. Now, if we're sitting here a year from today debating Pinecrest, please stand there all day and prevent us because that's certainly not what I personally would like to see. But if that's what the rest of council, but you're grossly misinterpreting this process and I wish you would pay, continue to watch it unfold. You know what they call Harvard all these all these people? They call Harvard a major school district on the East Coast. That's what they call it. $110,000 of students. And yet nobody has been objecting. That, that should have been fought dearly. How did, the one objection that I had about moving to Gates Mills, which my wife very much wanted to, was because of the taxes. And the taxes are driven by the school system. And the thought that it costs double to send the kids through the Mayfield High School, the Mayfield School District, than it does to, to send a kid to Harvard, and you're sitting here congratulating yourself is is it's just it's mind boggling. Who does that? Uh, again, Mark, information. I would like to know. Council and the 27 anointed ones, what their connection is to the Mayfield School District. And if they have a financial gain from this kind of arrangement, how could you agree to spend that amount of money? Mark, um, we'll get information for you about what the um, what the cost per student is at Mayfield uh, because of the fact it's not 110,000, uh, because of the fact that a uh, few residents, fewer than we would like, attend the school. If you take the amount of taxes that we pay and divide it by that number, yeah, you're going to get a huge number, but that's not the cost but that's of... Yeah, but that's the reality. These people have a choice. Mark, many people in the community have um, uh, <laughs> family histories with private schools in the area, Gilmore, Hawken, um, university school, et cetera. And 
it wouldn't matter if for some of them, whether the school was number one in the state, they have that family legacy and they choose private schools. You know, that's their, that's their choice. How many, how many children are there in this uh, community, Mark? How many children are there uh, K through 12 in Gates Mills? Do you know? Well, you should, I would ask you to gather that information first before you're talking about percentages, small numbers, et cetera, and you really don't know the population. Well, I, I, for one, think it's worth it to at least look at our options on schools. Uh, it came out in the survey. It was downplayed in the results presentation, but it came out that Mayfield schools are perceived as an issue. The 110 number is right uh, for what I don't disagree, Sandra, with what you said, but it's right. Uh, I hear two reasons that people say we shouldn't talk about it. One is that it's radioactive subject will be labeled as racist, elitist, et cetera, et cetera. And the other is it's beyond our out with our control. But I don't think either one of those is a reason not to talk about it. The residents told us it was an issue. I think we owe it to them on the advisory committee and then on council to talk about this issue. When Dr. Barnes comes here in a month's time, we ought to summarize for him, I think, ahead of time, what our village said about Mayfield schools. And we should extract from the questionnaire answers every piece of information that was in there, which reflected opinion about Mayfield City Schools. A lot of that opinion is not based on fact, it's just based on what's in people's head at the time. And I think people are short of information when it comes to the schools. And we don't like having the conversation, so we don't give information. So I'm with Michael on this, and I, I understand exactly where Mark's coming from too. Um, this is the biggest deal we have in our future, is, to, is how we deal with the schools, if at all. We can, we can scratch around the edges by changing the way the village spends money or the way village taxes people. Um, but at the end of the day, we spend more money to Mayfield City Schools than to anywhere else. And uh, that needs to be challenged from time to time, because if we don't, no one will. I agree with you, and I think we have to do, come up with questions ahead of time for to, and supply them to the superintendent. And just like the tax issue, they're going to have an educational part also for the advisory committee as it relates to the schools. And that would be great for everybody in the village because people are running on. I believe that's in September. It's a very emotional issue um, and with little knowledge. Right. It'll, it'll, there's a lot absolutely. of facts. Yeah. by the fact that their public school was closed. But the goddamn teachers union would rather sit there and do the Jeffrey Tubin thing while collecting full salary, and they know they can get away with it. Nobody ever challenged that. We need to press them. Okay, Any, anything else? Okay, now, Sandra. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. No. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. I'm yes. Sorry. Sorry, sorry uh, Janet. Yes. 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 Thank you all for coming. <laughs>